In the office, all the employees were still in their places. The young guy answers his mobile phone and says that he received a request from the company and will send the result within three days. He put down the phone and leaned back in his chair. The main character's name is Mason. He is an advertising employee in the famous Abex company, and his life is very monotonous. Unexpectedly, Mason was approached by his manager, Eaton, who said that the situation on the market is not stable and layoffs are planned. After which he handed over a huge list of clients to call, Eaton always liked to give a lot of work that needed to be done outside of business hours. Eaton said that by tomorrow, potential clients should already be in the office. After two years of work, Mason's salary has not increased and the workload has constantly increased. As soon as Eaton left, Mason hurriedly began to work on the computer, when he suddenly heard a sharp sound in his ear, which said that the virtual sleep device was active. He was frightened. For a moment many thoughts appeared in his head. The voice continued to say that he was a visitor to the program that allows you to experience 100% of virtual reality dreams. In addition to his voice, a page appeared in front of his eyes with an icon in the middle. It looks like a virtual desktop of a computer. To check, he closed his eyes and opened them again a few seconds later, the page was still there. The high-resolution color icon in the center was so conspicuous. After a while, Mason was still immersed in shock when it was time to leave work. Only when James patted him on the shoulder did, he suddenly regained consciousness. James asked if he was all right, to which Mason replied that he just had a headache. There was no one else in the office. James said that the headmaster was having dinner tonight and they needed to go there. The director liked to host dinners, but Mason had sent the money home last week and had only $500 left. When James looked at Mason, he saw his sad face and asked if he didn't want to go. James understood that Mason had no money and offered to borrow money. Mason was dissatisfied with the fact that he could not manage his free time as he wanted, and he had to go to the event. Suddenly, they saw a long-legged, curvy young girl walking along the office corridor. James said she was amazing and she was already a headmistress. It was Emma as soon as she started working here. Thanks to her connections, she was quickly promoted and everything is under control for the beauty. Mason told James that he probably didn't have time to be with someone like her. Restaurant Bright Garden. Everyone rested and drank alcohol. Mason, along with his friend James, also sat at the table. Mason believed that he was lucky about Mason that he could make a friend like James. Old James graduated from the same university as him. Suddenly, something happened to Mason's eyes. The voice in his head said that there had been a successful implantation in the iris, successful connection with the optic nerve, successful connection with the brain, and connection with the central nervous system. Mason did not understand what was happening. He quietly asked only he sees this strange interface. The voice in his head answered that, of course, only Mason sees it. After all, the company is striving for the best individual interaction with the user. This program is perfectly able to read all thoughts, so they can communicate without washing that anyone will hear them. Mason asked why he was, because he did not buy this virtual product. The program replied that Mason was perfect for the dream tester. Mason did not understand what this meant. The program added that he would test the company's new project and be able to try on the role of the person he would always want to become. In other words, this is a game with elements of augmented reality. Mason was a little scared and asked the program to get out of his head but the program insisted on its own, saying that the system would allow him to become anyone and take full control into his own hands. Wouldn't he like to try to be in the role of another person and become completely different? Eaton entered the establishment with a girl they saw in the office. Eaton said that now the girl will be their director. Eaton introduced her head of advertising as the most capable employee, to which she replied that she would be glad to work with him. Mason was well aware that this guy only got ahead because he constantly flattered and served Eaton. The head of the advertising department, even when they met, did not stop praising the director of Eaton and said that he was an excellent leader and also gradually began to flatter the girl. Eaton also introduced her to several other employees, but suddenly the girl herself approached Mason and extended her hand to him and asked him his name. Mason was a little confused and even a little shy. He abruptly stood up, introduced himself with a smile and added that it was a pleasure to meet you. Eaton approached the girl and told her that Mason was an ordinary clerk Mason was upset because he never flattered his boss and his work was constantly underestimated. Eaton went on talking. He had an average capacity for work. He did not know how to communicate with clients. Mason was humiliated not only in front of the new boss, but also in front of all his colleagues. Director Emma said that she understood everything, wished everyone a good appetite and left with Eaton. James looked at Mason and he was sincerely sorry for him. 
After a while, they were already catching a taxi car on the street. Mason said that he worked hard and hoped that the boss would give him at least a little praise, but it was all in vain. James tried to reassure his friend and said that working hard is not the most important thing. The main thing is to be able to suck up to the management. Mason remembered the time when they were in college. At that time, James was one of the leaders in the fight against injustice and lawlessness of teachers. He thought that James has changed a lot since then. Suddenly, Eaton came out of the institution with the director, Emma. Eaton told her that there was no point in meeting with low-grade employees. Mason heard everything. Eaton said it wouldn't do any good if any of the employees started thinking they were their equal. Eaton warned Headmaster Emma that if she did not know her place and her responsibilities, she might be unemployed. Mason thought that not only was hard work not rewarded in any way, the bosses also wanted to spit on their personal lives. He was tired of it. The program in his head asked Mason if he understood what injustice surrounds him. Mason said that he would think about quitting tomorrow. But for now, he wanted to win back and told the program to copy the images of Principal Emma and Principal Eaton. But the program replied that the command was not correct. It could only copy one person and chose Director Emma as a priority. But Mason was surprised. He did not expect that this would happen. In a second, the program replied that the scan was completed and the character was created. 30 minutes later, Mason was at his apartment. He went into the apartment and was angry why the program did not say before that only one person could be scanned. The program replied that a surge of dopamine was detected in his blood and changed his voice to a woman's. The program playfully said that Mason is very cool, but Mason got embarrassed and said that he just thought it would be nice if he had a cute NPC made. The program said that the dreaming system starts at midnight and he needs to find a place to sleep. Mason was worried about what was happening in his head. He lay down on the bed, but he was very worried and could not sleep at all. But the program calmed him down and said that the developers had foreseen this. The program will interfere with the nervous system to achieve physical sleep. A few seconds had passed. Mason was already asleep. When Mason fell asleep, he seemed to fall to the floor. In front of him stood a delightful blue-eyed brunette who said that she had been waiting for their meeting for a long time. She said that she is the artificial intelligence that communicated with him and is also the administrator of the dream system and Mason can call her 63rd. Mason asked if the program had begun, but the program replied that before the battle began, they should replenish supplies. Now they are in the exchange office. When they entered room number one, there were many shelves in front of them with weapons, equipment, and uniforms. Military machete, two points. Huge truck, 40 points. Thermal underwear, 20 points. Individual die at one point. Mason's attention was attracted by an infinite battery. He was awesome. But as soon as Mason wanted to touch him, the girl hit him on the arm with a stick, saying that it was not for sale, and she just showed him everything. The girl said that points can only be earned by passing levels, and in the future it will be possible to use them, however, with each level the difficulty will increase, and points should be used wisely. Now Mason understood the game mechanics. Rubbing his injured hand, Mason asked if it was possible to hire an NPC. The girl pointed to herself. 10,000 points spent, and now she is at the complete disposal of Mason. The girl said that if he had no more questions, then the game officially began. She wished him a pleasant game and pointed to the entrance. Above the door was doomsday survival. The girl stepped aside and Mason began to disappear. Mason woke up in horror. Looking around, he realized that he was at home in bed. Everything was in order and nothing had changed. Mason thought that he was just an idiot because such technologies simply do not exist. And how could he believe it? He wanted to turn on the light, but there was no electricity. This had happened before, so Mason did not pay much attention to it. He got dressed and went to work. As soon as he stepped outside, he was amazed because cars were randomly standing on the road on the street. There were no people and things were scattered around. Mason did not understand where everyone had gone. Suddenly, very close by, he heard the sound of an airplane engine. The huge plane crashed, and almost immediately after Mason saw him, he crashed into a neighboring building. Mason managed to hide behind the car. He could not believe it. Did the program really work? And he ended up in a place where he needs to survive. The program began to speak in his head. The Doomsday Survival Dreams Virtual World launched. Difficulty level zero, duration 180 days. Mason screamed, like 180 days. He heard the sound of flowing water. Looking under the car, he saw that gasoline was leaking from it. Without thinking for a long time, he rushed to run away. And almost at the same time, the car exploded. Having run far enough away, he stopped at the wall. Initially, this scene might seem strange. But if you think about it, it's a sudden disappearance of people, so it's not unusual for a plane to crash. 
Mason thought that 180 days is a lot, but as long as he has enough supplies of food, water, medicine, he should not have any problems. Mason did not know what exactly to do now. He turned on the tape recorder. He put it on his shoulder and went to the men's clothing store. He tried on different clothes, paying no attention to prices. He took a lot of gold jewelry for himself, a bottle of good liquor, and now he is already walking along a deserted street like the king of this life. Suddenly he remembered Emma asking about her presence at the program, but the program did not answer, although he continued to shout loudly in the street. Suddenly he heard some noise nearby. Someone was quickly approaching him. It was a dog. Obviously when people disappear, no one takes care of their pets. But he was not reassured by the thought that Emma was nowhere to be found, that he had been deceived. Suddenly, on the road, he saw a tiger coming at him. He growled and was ready to throw himself at Mason. He tried to stop the tiger with words, but he began to quickly approach and rushed at Mason. This tiger was named Stupid, and he was the only tiger in the zoo. He got along well with people and therefore began to lick Mason. Zookeepers raised him from childhood, so he was affectionate, and many tourists came here to take pictures with him. He was very easy to recognize. He had no hair on his butt, and when the zoo workers, like all people, disappeared, he ran away from there. Mason did not understand how the program knew even about this tiger. The seventh day has come. Mason underestimated the challenge. He lost his water supply, so he had to drink mineral water from the supermarket. Since there was no electricity, all meat products and vegetables began to rot, and larvae spread everywhere. Of course, there were canned food and some other non-perishable products. But beriberi could be a big problem, and Mason did not know how much longer he could last. But that day he was lucky. He found a very useful thing for himself. Diesel generator, when Mason was young, he often had to use it. This generator had been running for at least seven days now, and it was getting very hot. Mason didn't know how much longer it could run. He decided to return to the generator in the evening. Perhaps this way the meat would last longer. There was a generator and a refrigerator, in connection with which Mason decided that this place would become a refuge for him. All the following months he collected supplies, and at night he weeded the ground to grow food. Here comes the 31st day. Mason didn't know what to do today. He gradually began to go crazy and imagined his friend James, with whom he communicated. Mason thought it would be a good idea to find a seed shop in order to grow new vegetables and fruits. But what if you let go of the steering wheel and crash into the wall at full speed? Then maybe he will wake up. But his friend James told him not to give up, because today the garlic would grow and he could try fresh vegetables. The problem was not only fresh vegetables. The city was full of shit and flies, as if Mason lived in a swamp. When he fell asleep, he felt the insects crawling over him. At night, nothing was heard around except for the sound of the wind, and Mason felt that he would soon break loose. James said that Mason might be out of the game, but how would he deal with being fired in real life if he didn't even have the fortitude to cope with survival? It's just a game, James said, and asked Mason to pull himself together. Mason thought that even in the game, his brother James gives him strength. Suddenly, Mason was blinded by the light of an oncoming car. He braked sharply and turned the steering wheel to the side. The accident was avoided. In the car that was going to meet him was Emma. He lost control and crashed into a nearby car on the road. Mason could not believe his eyes. Emma woke up in bed. She had a plaster on her face, but she did not remember what happened to her. There were men's clothes on the edge of the bed, and Emma didn't know where they were. She opened the door of the room. On the floor was a running diesel generator, and there was fresh food on the table, which surprised her very much, since everything in the city was practically rotten. She went into the next room, where Mason was shaving and grooming himself. He said that he had prepared dinner for her, which is on the table. They sat down at the table, and Emma began to eagerly eat cooked food. She remembered that they had already met at a corporate party, but asked to be reminded of his name. Mason introduced himself, and was glad that she had memories from real life. She asked Mason how he could do it all. Water, food, electricity. To which Mason replied that he even had his own garden on the street and asked how she managed to survive. Emma replied that she immediately went to her hometown in order to find her grandmother, but could not find a single living person, and Mason was the first person she met. Mason understood why he could not find her in the city for so long. He asked if she knew what had happened, but she didn't even know what happened. Mason realized that she did not know anything, and the next step would be an invitation to join him and work as a team. He said that he has all the conditions for life, and if they get sick, they will be able to take care of each other. The girl had absolutely no choice, she had nowhere to go, and she agreed to his proposal. But she immediately said that they needed to clarify something. What exactly did Mason ask? Emma said that he was not her type, and there would be no intimacy between them. 
Mason did not understand why she immediately thought about it. He desperately needed a partner, and more importantly, an interlocutor, because it was stupid to present a dressed-up mannequin as his friend James and communicate with him. He remembered the words of his boss, who said that you cannot put yourself on the same level with ordinary people. Mason did not understand why she immediately treated him so contemptuously, but agreed to her proposal. Emma added that of course she was not going to eat and drink just like that, and offered her help around the house. Mason agreed with this, but said that they would start from tomorrow, and now she needed to rest. When Mason went to bed, he tried to calm himself and not get angry, because it's just a game and has nothing to do with reality, and the fact that a girl needs personal space is normal. Now the 32nd day has come. Morning came, Mason was still lying in his bed. Something was happening in the house, and the noise bothered him. When he left his room, he saw that there were several boxes in the corridor, as if he was moving somewhere. On the second floor, he saw Emma, who was unpacking things. He asked her what she was doing. She said that she had chosen a room for herself to stay and removed all the things she did not need from there. And she also installed a walkie-talkie at the entrance to the room so that Mason could contact her without going inside. Mason didn't like it at all. He went into the room and asked Emma where his mannequin, which was constantly in this room. She told him that at night he looked intimidating and she threw him out into the street. Mason was shocked because she could have asked him first, but Emma asked in surprise if he was really so important. Mason said that it was his friend, like in the movies, because he was not so lonely if he thought of something as a person. Emma said that she could bring him back, but Mason was angry, and he himself followed him into the street. He had been living alone for a month, and from the very morning, he did not like the behavior of the new tenant. When Mason almost went outside, he turned his attention to the weapon box. One day, he collected several types of firearms from the police station and put them in this box. Type 92 handgun was missing. He immediately knew that Emma had taken it and became even angrier. He went into Emma's room. She asked him if he was going to go and cook them a meal. But Mason said it would be better for them to wash, clean and cook separately. She asked why he thinks so. Mason said that they needed to limit their meetings so that she would not be afraid of him and he would not embarrass her. What's the matter? Emma asked. She was a girl, and he was a man, and she needed to take some precautions, because she had no guarantees that he would not do anything. Mason said that he, of course, understands that she is rich, beautiful, and above him in status, so she is free to insult him and do whatever comes to her mind, but he was not going to limit himself in order to make her feel insecurity. The tension between them only increased. Emma was not used to being told such things. Mason tried to reassure her, he said that she could be sure that he was certainly not a gentleman, but he was not going to mistreat her either. He asks her to be less narcissistic and more pragmatic. Day 120. So the 120th day in the program began. This place has changed dramatically compared to what it was three months ago. The weather is not so stuffy and the stench of rot has completely disappeared. Emma planted a lot of plants outside and now this place looks like a real paradise. In her hands, the garden flourishes and many vegetables grow. When they quarreled for the first time, they hardly spoke. Mason wondered if it was possible to hold out for three months without communicating with anyone. He could not be without communication for so long. Sitting in the car, Mason began to complain about Emma to a mannequin sitting on the side seat, whom he represented as his brother James. He talked about the fact that she did not need communication at all, which was so necessary for Mason. Today, he had to deal with the problem of obtaining meat, which they had already run out of. Mason suggested that he might look for meat in supermarkets, where it might be found in tins that are covered in dead flies. He also thought that they could catch rats, but if they suddenly got sick, they were unlikely to be cured. That's right. He thought that it was possible to catch fish, although it grew on larvae. It looks quite edible from the outside. Mason decided everything. First, he decided to visit an old friend and then go fishing. After some time, he came to the zoo. The dunce was delighted with the appearance of Mason and their meetings brought peace to both of them. Mason was cuddling with the dunce and was surprised that the dunce was still alive. Two months ago, Mason saw him at the zoo gate. At that moment, he was enjoying other animals. Luckily, he still has no desire to attack other people. Until today, he has survived by feeding on rats and pets. Mason gave him the last piece of meat from the freezer, stroked the tiger and asked him to save this piece. Suddenly, the tiger became alert and rushed to the side with a roar. He attacked deer passing by. Mason knew that the deer in the zoo didn't have antlers. They were wild deer. Nature has already begun to invade human civilization. Suddenly, the weather began to change dramatically. Lightning flashed in the sky and thunder rumbled. 
Mason did not understand how the weather could change so quickly because the sun had been shining a few minutes ago. It began to rain heavily and gusts of wind rolled. It was a typhoon. Mason rushed to his car. He climbed into the car through the passenger seat where his imaginary friend James was sitting. The typhoon was about 10, but it was just unbelievable. Mason, given so much time lived, began to forget. After all, it was virtual reality and just a game, and the typhoon is another test. Mason suddenly remembered that Emma rides her bike uphill every day, and now she is probably at the very top. He promptly started the car and drove home with great speed. When he arrived at the house, he saw that the door was open. That could only mean one thing Emma hadn't returned home yet. The garden that Emma had so carefully looked after was almost completely destroyed. Mason rode crushing tomatoes planted and grown by Emma. He remembered how she kept rats away from her precious tomatoes, but now it didn't matter anymore. The main thing was to save her. He was driving down the road where Emma used to drive uphill. The typhoon did not stop and only increased its strength. From the darkness in the distance, he saw the dim glow of a flashlight. He realized that it could be Emma. Mason immediately turned the steering wheel of the car in the direction of the poorly visible glow of the flashlight. Having driven closer, near the post stood a soaking wet frozen girl. It was Emma. She was wearing a thin dress that did not warm her at all. She, with her last strength, held onto the post with both hands so that her fragile female body would not be blown away by the wind. There was a deep cut on Emma's right leg from which blood oozed. Mason ran up to her, and Emma just fell into his arms. She was completely exhausted and asked him if she would die. Picking her up in his arms, Mason confidently answered no. They quickly arrived at the first house they came across. Mason lit a brazier, standing in the middle of the room near the sofas. He could not believe that there was a willa on this mountain. He asked Emma if she had come here before. She shivered from the cold, was silent, and held her hand to her wounded leg. Mason noticed this and offered to treat her wound. But she bitterly replied that it was not necessary to do so. Now is not the time to get emotional. You may have been infected, Mason said. But the girl already said a little louder that she could handle it herself. Mason did not insist and told his plan. The house they lived in was very low and probably flooded, but this villa is high up on a mountain. Therefore, he suggested that they immediately move, collect all the supplies they had, and settle in this villa. Emma agreed and asked what her assignment was. Mason said that she was a woman with an injured leg, so she was staying here and waiting for him. At the same time, he reminded her to open the window periodically, because if this was not done, she could be poisoned by carbon monoxide from a fire. The rain and strong wind did not subside. There was not a trace of sunny, warm weather left. Leaving the Villa Mason, I put on a jacket because it was already cold outside. Snow was added to all other adverse weather conditions. Mason understood that he needed to hurry. He got into his car and headed straight for the house. Near the house, there was already knee-deep water. Mason, with difficulty, opened the door of the house and went inside. The refrigerator was broken. All vegetables from the garden were washed away before they were ripe. Those stocks from the refrigerator, which were designed for three days, now they will eat in one. They have very little food. Mason did not know what to do. Fishing with such a strong wind was no longer real. Even the rat holes were flooded. They had absolutely nothing left. Such is life, it consists of ups and downs. Out of desperation, Mason got into the car and asked his imaginary friend James what to do and where to find food. After some thought, Mason went to the zoo. When he drove up to the zoo, Dunce was sitting near his entrance. Mason got out of the car and approached him and said that he needed his help. When he got closer to the goon, he was badly injured. He told the dunce that they could hunt together. The dunce would track the prey and Mason could kill it with a gun. And if the dunce got hurt, he could heal him. He put his arm around Dunce and wanted to put him in the car. But Dunce didn't budge. He looked into the distance and waited for something. Hurry up, Mason shouted at him, because if an infection got into his wound, he could die. Mason continued to shout at him with the words, you are not Hachiko's dog. The beater will not come. He tried to move him by force. But despite the fact that Mason fed him for several months, the tiger growled at him and did not leave his place. Damn yoke, said Mason. He turned away from him and said that he could not return to him until the end of the storm. Dunce lowered his head in frustration. Mason turned to look at him for the last time. His wounds were bleeding. The rain and strong wind did not stop enveloping his body. But Dunce faithfully waited like a real devoted dog. Mason was already approaching Willa. He told his friend James that this game is too real, Emma, like Dunce sometimes cannot contain her emotions. Mason wondered how his brother James always managed to be so calm. Due to the lack of communication, Mason inspired his disguised mannequin and communicated with him on an equal footing as with an ordinary person. 
Approaching the house, Mason was horrified. Emma lay on the pavement with a bucket next to her. He asked what happened. Emma replied that she wanted to collect rainwater, as she didn't want to be a burden. Mason said with a smile that he was grateful to her, but now she can't get up. He walked up to her and abruptly threw the fragile girl onto his shoulder. She screamed to let her go because they agreed that she was the main inside and he was the main outside. But Mason did not listen to her and tightly clasping her hips with his hands, he carried her into the house. Emma continued to scream and try to break free. With a slight movement of his hand, Mason hit her hips with his palm. She screamed once, but at the same time she stopped resisting. Stop acting up, said Mason. Now he's in charge here, both in the house and on the street. He abruptly threw her onto the bed, and he ordered to wait for him until he brought a first aid kit, and if she dared to act without permission, he would beat her. She kept insisting that she didn't need help. Mason replied that he himself was not happy to help her. They had little food left, that's what he thinks about first of all. You better get well soon and stop giving me trouble, said Mason, otherwise they were in danger of starving to death. He brought cotton swabs and medicines with which he began to treat the wound on Emma's leg. She asked him where he would look for food. Mason said that he saw a herd of deer in the city, but they ran away from him. Tomorrow, he will definitely go hunting. Emma was surprised where the herd of deer in the city came from. People disappeared, and the animals simply expanded their habitat. Emma said that wild animals remember dangerous smells well, and in the future they will be very vigilant if they smell it. Mason was not sure about this, but he had a gun. Speaking of weapons, Mason took out a gun and said that he found it under Emma's pillow. Emma said that all the cartridges were in place and she no longer needed him. But Mason handed her a gun. She was surprised and asked if he wanted to take it back. Mason said that these are hard times and the gun she has will dispel all prejudices. Mason told Emma to go to bed early. He needed to get ready for the hunt. Day 121, everything outside was covered with snow. Mason looked out the window and simply could not believe that it was snowing outside. He was ready to hunt. He was wearing warm clothes, packed a backpack and loaded guns. He was heading for the mountains where, according to Mason, there should have been a herd of deer. Mason did not know how to hunt at all. They never set traps and he had to rely only on weapons. But he was worried because of the words of the girl who said that wild animals remember the smell of the enemy. From childhood, Mason did not kill anyone. He doubted whether he had the courage to kill a deer. Just in case, he took several fish ponds with him. He hoped that at least some fish would fall into this cage because he had no bait. While Mason was driving a car, he did not even suspect that he was being watched. A pack of wolves also roamed the mountains in search of prey. Mason parked his car and went hunting. The forest was quiet and the crunch of snow was distinctly audible with every step he took. Suddenly, Mason heard the sound of running deer in the distance. Without hesitation, he rushed to run in their direction. The weapon was ready. He took aim, but the deer was out of sight. He heard the deer again nearby. Until now, he did not even see his shadow and did not understand where the deer was. It seemed to him that the deer foresaw his every step and simply played with him. Mason was out of breath. He thought again about the words of Emma, who said that deer sensitively hear the smell of danger. Mason thought that this was a waste of time and energy, and therefore decided to try to catch fish in the tank. Although it was cold outside, the water in the river did not freeze. Mason doubted very much whether he could catch a fish with such a strong current. He threw his cage into the river. He understood that he had no other opportunity to catch fish, and this tank was the only one. The rope of the garden was sharply stretched and dragged Mason into the water. He lost his only garden. But for Mason, the most important thing was to get out of the water. He was lucky the river was not deep and Mason managed to get out. He urgently needs to get home and warm up. Right next to the river, Mason saw a deer. He could not believe his eyes because he had been looking for him for so long. And now was not the right moment. Mason started looking for his gun, but he drowned in the river along with the cage. Then Mason took out a shotgun. From such a short distance, he should have hit. He only had one chance. Mason collected his thoughts. Despite the stiffness of the whole body from the water, he was ready to shoot. The deer was calm and did not feel any danger from Mason. He fired a shot. Due to the strong recoil, the shotgun slid off his shoulder and hit Mason in the nose with the stock. Mason missed and the deer ran away. Nosebleed began to drip onto the fresh snow. Mason's nose was bleeding and hurting a lot. At that moment, he thought that the game was very realistic. He walked to his car. During that day, he lost a lot of useful things. And at the same time, he felt an irresistible feeling of hunger. Suddenly behind him, Mason heard a quiet creak of snow. Looking closer, he saw two wolves, who saw him when he was driving a car to hunt. Mason had already reloaded his shotgun and was ready to fight back. But the wolves turned around and did not follow him. 
Mason was frightened by the appearance of wolves, but when they began to move away from him, he realized that the danger had bypassed him. Thirty minutes later, he was at home. He quickly entered the room where the barbecue was burning, where Emma sat naked, wrapped in a blanket, and tried to warm herself. As soon as he entered, without saying a word, he began to undress. Emma was frightened and asked what he was up to. Mason immediately tried to justify himself and said that she should not think anything indecent. He just fell into the river and wanted to warm himself. Emma turned away and said that he didn't have to rush in and undress right away. She was frightened by his behavior. When Mason undressed, his wallet fell on the bed and opened. He did not pay attention to it at all. Emma saw in his wallet a photograph of Mason, who was hugging a girl she did not know. That girlfriend of yours in the wallet photo, Emma asked. An ex-girlfriend, Mason answered. Then why did you break up? Mason said that he wanted a family and for her, relationships were just fun. He asked Emma if she had a boyfriend. His name is John, Emma said. He's a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, CEO of a technology company. Mason said with a smile that he probably had poor eyesight and would have a hard time with her, subtly hinting at his advanced age. Emma turned to him in a rage and said that he had no right to mock her because she was his boss. Mason sat in front of her completely naked and did not expect that she would turn around so suddenly and look at him. Seeing Mason completely naked, she covered her eyes with both hands and said that she did not do it on purpose. As she raised her arms, the blanket fell from her shoulders. Mason looked at her naked, firm breasts and could not tear his eyes away. Emma did not immediately realize that she was sitting in front of him completely naked. When she removed her hands from her eyes, she saw that Mason was looking at her breasts. She abruptly took Mason's t-shirt and threw it at him with an exclamation to turn away. Mason dodged the t-shirt thrown at him, but before his eyes he still had Emma's big breasts. It was amazing. Day 122. Mason crawled through the snow-covered forest. He did not give up trying to track down the deer. He was already close enough to them that if he crawled even closer, they could hide in the forest and it would all be in vain. Mason had never fired a real weapon before and was unsure of his accuracy. At the same time, he fired from a shotgun, which is completely unsuitable for long-range shooting. A loud shot rang out. Mason looked into the distance and understood that if he did not manage to get closer, then they would simply die of hunger. Day 124, they began to communicate more and more. Mason constantly bandaged her leg, and Emma did not complain that he came empty-handed. Emma was very smart, but also very independent. Mason did not tell her about the wolf pack. Because of her nature, she is forced to force herself to take responsibility. Only now Emma is getting weaker and weaker, and her wounds show no signs of healing. A lot of time has passed since they ate normally. Mason tried to calm Emma. He said that everything would work out tomorrow. He even set a trap. It was an ordinary wolf pit. It is a deep pit covered with snow, at the bottom of which there are sharp stakes. He placed lettuce leaves on the snow-covered ground to lure the deer. Emma said that he should have discussed this with her, because it takes a lot of effort and energy to make such a trap. She was right. Mason simply did not have the strength to build a second trap. Tomorrow everything will be decided, life or death. A new day came and Mason was driving his car through the forest. He drove up to the trap he had created, got out of the car, and saw that the trap worked. He moved closer, but there was nothing at the bottom. There were traces of blood in the very corner. Mason was delighted. So the animal still fell into a trap, and now you need to follow its trail. He was full of hope that the deer that came across was badly wounded and fell nearby. After all, if they had one deer, they would have managed to survive. Going a little further, he already saw a carcass in the distance. But when he came closer, he simply could not believe his eyes, because the wolves had already eaten the deer carcass. Angry, Mason took out his shotgun and started firing randomly. He screamed with all his might, without stopping the word go away. This is my prey. Mason did not hit once, and both wolves, taking with them the remains of the carcass of a deer, ran away. The cartridges in the Belitus ran out and Mason fell to his knees. He was depressed. All hopes crumbled to dust. He tried his best to hide his emotions because this is just a game. But emotions took over and he screamed in despair. Day 126. Mason sat by Emma's bed. The clock was seven in the morning. On the nightstand next to the bed was a tomato and lettuce, their last meal. Emma said she hadn't helped in a long time and therefore she didn't deserve a helping. Mason said that he would not take this food because Emma was on the verge of death. Emma was embarrassed because no one had cared about her like that before. In fact, she lived her entire childhood under strict control. She spent most of her childhood locked up in her room. Her father told her what to do and what not to do. She often wondered what was happening outside the window and why she couldn't go out and play like her brothers. 
but her father forbade her to even think about it. Her father said that sooner or later she would leave the family, just like her mother who spread her legs everywhere. Her father obliged her to become a normal person and benefit the family. Her father never ceased to humiliate her and mock her. Loneliness was a good teacher for Emma. All her confidence has always been that she had no one to rely on in life. She was always alone. After that, Emma asked if he thought of her the way she really did in her life. Of course, he did not expect to hear such revelations from Emma, but at the same time, he said that it used to be not easy for all of them. Mason tried his best every day, but he was not appreciated, and now he does not even know if it is worth trying at all. Emma asked if there was something special about him that other people didn't. Only one thought came into his head. If he was sure of something, he would never give up. Emma said he needed to try to stand out. After all, if you do not try to outshine everyone else, no one will notice you and you will not be recognized by others. Loneliness helped Emma shine. After all, she had to understand what to do when she was fighting for her life. Mason asked if he would help her survive, if he would get her approval. He would like to be praised by the head so that the board of directors would say that you are such a good fellow, Mason. Without you, everything would be over. Emma said that if he helped her survive, then she would not be alone. Then Mason said to me, he took a lettuce leaf from the bedside table and said before leaving, if he does not return by the third morning, there is a suburb to the east of this cottage, where there is a small river. She can find his body there. He left the room and slammed the door. Emma was confused. Mason went down to his car from where he took a dummy. He carried it into the house, and at the same time said that Emma was right. He never had to fight for something. He put the mannequin on the railing that was on the balcony. In this game, he always complained to this mannequin, imagining him as his brother James. He always tried to get away from the noisy environment and avoid difficult questions where he had to make a choice. But Mason understood that he could fix everything, the relationship in the family, studying at school, bringing a girlfriend. But in the end, Mason is constantly squeezed into a corner and constantly complains about an unfair world. He was determined that he would never complain again. Determined to change his character, he pushed the mannequin with his hand and he began to quickly fall down the cliff. Emma fell asleep. She dreamed of a brazier heating their house. Then she takes the knife, approaches Mason lying on the floor, raises his hand with the knife up, and starts to cut it. She woke up abruptly and screamed. She was scared. She realized that it was just a dream. For the first time in three months, she had a dream. She remembered Mason's words that his body would lie by the river. She couldn't bear the thought that if Mason died, she would have to eat him in order to survive. Day 127. Mason was near the river and he had a plan. The first time he came to the river, he got closest to the deer. Never before had he been able to get this close. So the water masks his smell. He knew it was too risky, but he had no choice. Meanwhile, Emma couldn't sleep. Her father's voice sounded in her head, saying that she looked pathetic. She even started to see her father, who kept saying that she should have listened to him. Now she is nothing, only because she did not do as he wanted. Emma waved her hand in his direction and shouted, Get out! She was aware that these hallucinations began to arise due to hunger. Emma put her hand on the last tomato on the nightstand. She remembered that Mason wanted to hear his boss's praise. She promised to hold out for two days. But whether he has time or not, she must continue to live by herself. Several hours passed. Emma just lay there. She couldn't sleep because she was hungry. Suddenly, she heard a rustling near the bed. Opening her eyes a little, Emma saw a rat sniffing at a tomato lying on the bedside table. Another hallucination. Her father talked about how she should have married John. After all, he is very rich and was soon to die. In order for her to be able to marry him, she must be well-groomed and flawless. Her father kept insulting her and saying that she couldn't be strong. She only pretends to be strong, but she really isn't. He said that she would die in this bed, after which the rats would eat her. That's what happens when you want independence and freedom, her father used to say. Meanwhile, near the river, the deer found a leaf of lettuce lying on the snow, and he began to chew it. Emma pulled a gun from under her pillow, pointed it at her father. She said that she might die a terrible death, but before that she would be calm, because she didn't go with him. She doesn't need anyone to save her life. Deer noticed Mason, who was aiming a shotgun at him. A shotgun blast rang out, and a pistol shot. The dead deer lay on the snow. Mason began to dig out from under the snow. He approached the deer, put his hand on his head. He was no longer breathing. Mason could not restrain his emotions and shouted with joy throughout the forest. Emma started eating the last tomato, and at the same time fry the dead rat on the grill. Before finishing her tomato, she heard someone enter the house. It was none other than Mason, hearing the smell of food in the house. He chuckled and said quietly that if he knew that she had already eaten, he would not be in a hurry. Then he fell to the floor, dead. Emma ran up to him and asked what happened. She tried to turn him over. His clothes began to crack. Ice fell off him. 
After a while, Emma had already butchered the deer and hung the meat out to dry. She heated water on the grill and poured water into the bathroom, where Mason was lying. She tried to talk to him, but he didn't answer. Suddenly, he grabbed her hand and softly spoke her name. She leaned closer to him. He asked her if he had her approval. She immediately began to praise him, saying that he was great, and if not for him, she would have died altogether. Mason smiled, pleased with Emma's words. He said that the last words that the girl said to him at parting were, You have nothing. What's the point of continuing to communicate? It was so hard for Mason to get anyone's approval in this world. Emma agreed with him completely. After a while, Emma made soup. She called Mason to eat. He lay a few meters from her on the bed, but did not answer. Emma walked over to him and put her hand to his nose. He was still breathing. Emma said that she would pay back her debt. He would be all right. She fed him soup. Then she put her hand around his mouth and kissed him. Several hours passed. Mason was still cold, but Emma had already covered him with three blankets. Mason was shivering from the cold. Emma couldn't watch him freeze. She saw no other way. Emma took off her dress, threw it on the floor, then immediately took off her panties and bra, which she also threw aside. She lay down under the covers to Mason, hugged him, and began to warm him with her body, while saying that everything would be fine with him. The 130th day arrived. Mason woke up and felt something behind him. Immediately behind him, under the covers, lay Emma. He was surprised and embarrassed. Her elastic large breasts pressed tightly against his back, from which goosebumps ran over his skin. He hoped he wouldn't get an erection. Emma woke up too and asked if Mason woke up. She began to remove her hand, but Mason grabbed her and put her back on his body. He said that he had not yet fully woken up. Immediately he realized that he was talking some kind of nonsense and she might think that he had an ulterior motive. He let go of her hand and Emma did not remove it. She asked why Mason broke up with his girlfriend. Mason said that his girlfriend was windy and did not want a serious relationship unlike him. He just wanted to start a family. Emma quietly told him in her ear that she wanted it too. Mason did not expect to hear such things from her, because earlier she said that she wanted to prove to the whole world that she was herself. Emma said that would be her proof. Is being a strong woman the same as being single? Being strong is just a way to escape slavery. She needed to stick to this path, not think about anything else, just run. Is it all the time she did not run from one slavery to another? In the end, Emma didn't know if she could be considered strong when she could never make a choice on her own. Mason could not understand her. He never had his own way. Finally, she asked Mason if he wanted to start a family with her. Mason did not expect this and did not immediately know what to answer. She apologized to him and said that she must be rushing things. Mason took her hand and said that he also had many problems in life. But the most important goal was to create his own family. Family is what makes him move forward. They bonded tenderly and passionately. Their bodies merged into a single whole, like two halves of one wholeness. Mason, being on top, he felt inexperience hindering him, not knowing how to properly embody love with a girl. However, Emma felt it was time to take matters into her own hands. She abruptly turned Mason over, taking over. Now she was sitting on it. Excitement seized Mason and he cautiously asked Emma if she was confident in her abilities. In response to his doubts, she slapped him firmly on the cheek. The slap implied that their relationship was not yet married, but based on mutual respect and support. With her words, they merged into perfect harmony. Emma felt his presence in her, and goosebumps of bliss permeated her body, like waves splashing on the shore. Emma began to perform intense movements that gave them both an indescribable pleasure. Mason, unfamiliar with such experiences, quickly reached his limit under the influence of this hurricane of touch. This scene enveloped them both in a magic that permeated every fiber of their being, so strong and exciting that it ended too quickly. While she was lying on it, she remembered what happened to her in her youth. She sat tied up in her father's room. My father said that children grow up very quickly. Before he even had time to blink, Emma was already an adult girl. He said that the time has come when Emma should get a taste of adulthood. Today was her last lesson. Father loudly allowed those standing on the other side of the door to enter. A young boy and girl entered the room and politely greeted Emma's father as if he were their boss. He ordered them to make love on the couch. Young people obediently began to undress and began the process. Emma was very scared at that moment. She closed her eyes and turned away as she did not want to look at it. But her father strongly turned her head and forced her to look at what was happening. He said that old John might have problems with movements, so she had to sit and watch the process. The father said that now they should look like relatives. Now her name will be Emma. Emma recalled the events that had happened to her several years ago with bitterness in her eyes. Mason's hand felt for a wet spot on the blanket and could not believe his eyes. Emma was also a virgin. Day 160. Mason has been living with Emma for a month now. 
He really enjoyed this month. Unfortunately, frostbite has not gone unnoticed, and he often does not feel his right leg. But nevertheless, he can work. The reindeer has been gone for a long time. The river became icy due to low temperatures and ice fishing became their main source of food. Emma didn't want to sit back either, and Mason worked with her to build the greenhouse. Emma stopped Mason. She said she had a present for him. He had no idea that Emma would give him just that. A few hours later, he was already on the hunt and shot a deer. Emma's gift was a fur cape made from the skin of the first deer he had killed. He could not imagine that the prey for which he almost died was now easily accessible to him. He put the deer he had killed in his car and drove home. On the way, he passed a pole. He was flooded with memories when, in a raging hurricane, he found Emma at this particular pillar, passing by my old apartment. He drew attention to the plane, which on the very first day of his stay in the game, hit the building. Mason came to the family zoo, the home of his friend Dunce. He began to call the tiger as he brought him a part of the killed deer and wanted to please him. Suddenly he heard a growl somewhere nearby. It was not only the growl of a tiger. Rushing into the cage where the dunce lived, he saw four wolves nibbling on different sides of a tiger lying on the ground. Mason abruptly removed the shotgun from his shoulder, and he started shooting at the wolves. His shooting skills have improved markedly, and he even managed to injure two wolves. However, they all ran away. He was glad that he had succeeded in driving the wolves away. Mason approached the booby, but he was badly bitten. Warm blood oozed from his wounds onto the snow. The dunce could not even get up. His eyes were ajar, and life faded away in him a little. Mason, with tears in his eyes, remembered their first meeting, the way he stroked his face, and fed with fresh meat. Sorry I'm late, Mason said. The tiger growled softly, languishing in pain. Mason got to his feet, removed his shotgun from his shoulder, pointed it at the tiger and said, It won't hurt any more, good boy. I will miss you and I will definitely avenge you. Tears flowed down his cheeks. Mason closed his eyes and fired. A few hours later, Mason was already lying in the bathroom of his house. Emma lay behind him, hugging him with her legs before Mason's eyes there was a scene with a wounded goon. Emma could not understand what was bothering him, to which Mason replied that it was not safe on the street and he would not want Emma to go out without him. He didn't want anything to happen to Emma. Emma agreed and said she had a lot to do with the vegetables in the shed. She leaned her head towards him and they kissed again. This time Mason turned to her and was on top. He began to kiss her neck and slowly descended lower to her elastic, wet breasts. But he did not think about love. There was a hunt in his head. He had already entered her and from intense movements, the water from the bathroom splashed onto the floor. Now he has a family and he will not allow her to be harmed. Emma moaned in pleasure as she scratched his back harder. Mason will fight for his family to the last drop of blood. Now the wolves are his prey. Mason knew that he would use the wolf hunting cape Emma had given him. When the wolves hunted deer in the forest, Mason was already waiting for them in the bushes. One of the wolves rushed at him, but the shotgun blast was relentless. The rest of the wolves fled. Mason took out his hunting knife and ended one of his enemies once and for all. He lay back in his bed, his eyes filled with hatred. Mason thought about how to finish off the remaining wolves. Emma disturbed him. She said that today he was some kind of aloof, and if he told her what was happening to him, she could help him. Mason rudely replied that she could not help him deal with the wolves. Emma was a little offended and fell silent. Mason realized that she shouldn't have answered rudely, after which he hugged her with a smile and said that he could handle the wolves himself. There are only three of them left. The hunt has begun again. The wolves heard Mason approaching and they started running in different directions. One of the wolves stopped at the bushes, started sniffing. In the bushes, he saw the face of his relative. Then he began to slowly run up to him, but the muzzle of a shotgun poked out of the bushes, and a loud shot sounded, from which the wolf fell on the spot. The remaining two wolves began to watch Mason. Now he had two capes. One of them was from the skin of a killed deer, and the second from the first killed wolf. Two wolves were aggressive. Now their main target was Mason. Day 170. Mason practiced bottle shooting in his yard. He could not find the remaining two wolves. They seemed to have evaporated. He remembered their ferocious looks. And if he didn't kill them, he might end up like the dunce. For peace of mind, Mason needed to finally end them. Emma came up behind him. She steamed fish and grilled meat. She wanted Mason to appreciate her culinary skills. Mason refused. He said that he would pack a tent and leave for a couple of days. Emma was upset when she heard about this. Mason has been leaving early in the morning for several days and returning late. They can't even eat together. I'm sorry, Mason said. He had unfinished business he had to do to keep them safe. Emma turned away and was about to leave, but emotions got the better of her. She turned around and yelled, at least tell me what's wrong. Mason couldn't tell her because she would be worried. 
He turned around and started walking away. Emma stood and cried. Day 173. Emma woke up in her bed. She looked out the window, but the window was boarded up with sticks. Mason blocked all the windows of the house with sticks. Emma went outside and asked him why he was doing this. Not wanting to answer this question, Mason said he was just fixing their windows and would be done soon. Emma was angry with him. She firmly said that she did not want him to protect her. Mason turned around and with a smile told Emma to stop joking. Emma was not joking. She showed with all appearance that she was quite serious. She said that they are going back to the relationship that they had in the first months, as if there was nothing between them. She said in all seriousness that Mason just used her and did not want to start a family, since he is behaving like that now. Mason said that he does all this only for the sake of their family. Emma could not stand it and began to demand explanations from Mason. She wanted at least some respect for her. Mason also began to raise his voice and said that she could not help him in any way. The only way she could help was to stay at home and rest until he was done. Emma stood silently, her head lowered in frustration like a small kitten. Mason did not have enough nails. He thought that he needed to call in a hardware store. These two wolves outplayed him. There was more and more snow. Soon everything around became white, and the tracks, which were already poorly visible, were finally swept up by snow. The temperature approached minus 30 degrees and continued to fall. There was no point in hunting anymore. The biggest problem was how to heat the house. As for the two wolves, he needed to strengthen the windows and doors of the house. Emma began to get nervous and Mason did not want to swear with her because of this. Mason arrived at the hardware store. This shop was quite well kept and had all the necessary tools. Nails, wire, electrical tape. Mason came across a book. This was a diesel generator maintenance manual. He took off his gloves and began flipping through the book. Suddenly, the TV started working in the store. The administrator of the game appeared on the screen. Mason has completely forgotten that this is just a game. She came for a reminder that there was only a week left until the end of the game. Mason had to be ready to leave the game. Emma was standing outside the house writing a note. She gathered her things and loaded them into the car. In the note, she wrote that they needed time to calm down a bit. She leaves to look for a new place and Mason should not look for her. Mason, out of anger, smashed the TV on which the reminder was broadcast. He gathered all the necessary things in a bag and now he understood how to fix the generator. Outside the store, he heard a menacing growl that pierced the air like the voice of nature filling the space with mystical intensity. The two powerful wolves that entered the store were the embodiment of a thirst for revenge and intransigence. Mason couldn't believe his eyes they found him. He killed two members of their family and the wolves wanted revenge. They seized Mason with surprise like a storm coming in a dark night. As soon as he got close to his shotgun, the wolves were already there, standing in front of him, blocking the path of freedom. The shotgun, a powerful weapon, has become an inseparable part of this tense situation, as if a symbol of the possibility of destruction or salvation. The situation escalated a little. Mason, filled with determination and devoid of fear, prepared to give them a lesson. He rushed to the exit, passionately striving to reach his car, like an island of hope in the darkness of danger. However, the deep snow hiding the pit lay in wait for him, and Mason, twisting his leg, fell awkwardly to the ground. One of the wolves immediately jumped on his back, seeing his opportunity in him. The wolf grabbed the deerskin in its mouth and dragged it without letting go. The second wolf grabbed his leg, not wanting to let go of his prey. Mason unfastened the deerskin. The wolf that was dragging her was thrown aside. Mason hit the second wolf with a bag from which he fell. Taking his knife, Mason squeezed it in his hand, preparing for a decisive confrontation. The fight turned into a deadly duel where every blow was a real test. The second wolf ran up and bit him deeply on the back. Mason turned around, throwing his foot in the direction of the attacker, trying to maintain strength and will to win. However, at that moment, he discovered that the blade of the knife had broken off, depriving him of his main weapon. The wolf, emboldened by this advantage, rushed at Mason with even more aggression, like a living fire in his eyes. Mason realized that this fight had become a fight for life and death. The wolf bit him on the cheek, but Mason kicked him away, showing his unrelenting strength and determination. The rage and rage that surged within him became his weapon as he stabbed again and again with the hilt of the knife. With a precise blow, Mason knocked out the left eye of the wolf, leaving him without a powerful weapon. The wolf fell to the ground, and Mason proceeded to finish him off using the handle of a knife. Blood spattered all around, filling the air with violence and rage, but Mason did not stop not letting up in his rage until the wolf completely stopped resisting. When the wolf stopped resisting, Mason stopped. Ob threw the hilt of his knife beside the bloody wolf. Leaving the knife handle near the bloody wolf, 
Mason took his bag and continued on his way to the car. His clothes were all torn, and his blood and the blood of the wolf were mixed on it, as if the elements had merged in a battle dance. Memories popped into his head. He demanded answers from the administrator to his questions. He did not know what would happen to Emma if he left the game. He could not let her stay here alone, because she is his wife. But the connection with the administrator was already lost, and it was because of this that he broke the TV that was in the store. Slowly but steadily, Mason made his way to his car, overcoming physical pain and emotional anguish. The wolf, with one eye, rose, refusing to give up. He was burning with hatred and a thirst for revenge, not ready to accept defeat so easily. Mason turned, meeting the insane determination of the wolf with his eyes. He knew he would stop at nothing to get revenge. However, Mason couldn't let that happen. He has to protect Emma and provide her with a trouble-free future. Emma drove up to the pole where Mason found her during the storm. She could not hold back her tears. Her car was parked near a pole and she sobbed without stopping. Day 177, Mason tried to get into the car. The wolves gnawed at his legs and prevented him from doing so. Mason couldn't die, not now. A pistol fell out of the glove compartment of the car. Mason was surprised. He did not understand when Emma managed to put him there. He took a pistol and shot several times in the direction of the wolves. They were afraid of the shots and fled. Finally, Mason was able to get into the car and close the door. He was bleeding all over, but he still tried to control himself. He needed to go back and fix the generator. Then Emma would have a chance to survive if he left the game. He tried to drive the car, but all attempts failed. The car wouldn't start. It was too cold outside. The wolves stood not far from the car and waited for Mason to get out of it again. Due to the cold and loss of blood, Mason began to lose consciousness and had already come to terms with death. Mason woke up all bandaged. He was lying on his bed. Emma sat next to him and watched quietly. Mason asked what happened. She said he was unconscious in the car when she found him, so she brought him home in her car. Mason thought he was already dead. Mason asked Emma if she saw anything else near the car, thinking that she might have seen the wolves. Emma said that his bag was lying nearby, and she took it with her. He abruptly began to get up. Mason wanted to quickly repair the generator in order to turn on the heating. Emma stopped him. With such injuries, the question of his recovery will take several days. But Mason said he couldn't afford to rest. Emma understood that she could not stop Mason because of his persistent nature. Mason came to the garage. He immediately began to repair the generator. With the help of tools taken from the store and a repair book, he succeeded. He came out of the garage, looked at the house from which the light shone. He was sure that it was worth all the hardships he went through. Mason shouted to the whole street about being happy with this world as never before. Emma was in the house and calmly cut the meat because the light for her was not the main thing. Mason went to the entrance to the house. Near the gate was a red car, which he had not seen before. He realized that it was in this car that Emma had brought him. When he carefully examined the car, he saw that the front bumper was broken and there was a lot of blood on it and the driver's airbag worked in the cabin. Mason coughed and sank down to the wheel of the car. Something is stuck in the front wheel. It was a wolf's fang. Mason began to realize that Emma had crushed the wolves. He started to get up but fell back to his knees. Mason coughed even harder. He was bleeding from his mouth. He realized that without a real doctor, he would not live long. He went to the house. He saw that two wolf skins hung from the boarded up windows. Mason approached Emma from behind while she was slicing meat and put his arm around her waist. He was sad and Emma asked him why he was depressed. Wasn't he super brave? Mason laid his head on her shoulder and asking for forgiveness said that the boss should forgive the mistakes of her subordinates. Each of them was aware of his contribution to the common cause. They were like a real family. Emma asked if he wanted wolf meat stew. Mason asked her to finish quickly because they should have had time to make love. Day 178, the sun rose and the proud was completely covered with snow. Emma opened the curtains and looked surprised. She told Mason to wake up because the blizzard had stopped. But he just coughed. Mason said that there was no strength in his body at all and he could not stand up. Emma assumed he had a cold and went to get some medicine. Mason told her not to bother looking. He felt that this was no ordinary cold. Emma refused to believe it and continued to look for cures, reassuring him that she would get him back on his feet, transporting supplies during a storm, hunting in the cold, repairing a generator. You've been through all the hard times, Emma said. It's a shame that a capable worker like him wasn't appreciated by management, Emma continued. Thank you, dear, said Mason. But Emma has not yet promised to marry him, hinting that they still have everything ahead. She handed him a glass of water. Mason took it but could not hold it. Emma wanted to catch a glass, but she didn't have time. 
The glass fell to the floor and broke. Several hours passed, Mason opened his eyes. Emma lay on top of him in black velvet underwear. She began to pull the covers off him and said she understood his little game. Pretending to be sick to get her to take care of herself, she continued to say in a gentle voice that she was not angry with him. She was already on top of him, but he told her to stop. They needed to have a serious talk. She was angry that Mason was refusing her at such a moment. Tears began to appear in her eyes. She squeezed Mason's shirt more and more tightly. Unable to contain her emotions, she burst into tears. She screamed, asked him to get up, but Mason could not do it. He coughed again and quietly began to say that he did not have long. He knows that he will die soon. There should have been enough gasoline in the storage for three months. If it runs out, let her go to the north of the city. There is still a lot of gasoline. Vegetable seeds were in a black plastic bucket in the warehouse. The diesel generator must be running. The service manual has instructions for repairing it. Don't forget to find a new vehicle with a large payload and be sure to practice shooting, said Mason. Emma did not stop crying. Without listening to the end, she hugged him tightly and did not let go. Day 180. Emma rolled Mason out into the street in a wheelchair. He was a little surprised that the snow had ended. Emma said that it stopped snowing yesterday. It was already quite warm, and Emma was sure that the temperature would soon rise above zero. As soon as the snow melts, she plans to drive towards the north. She wants to find other survivors. Mason turned to her and asked, Emma, did you love me? She carefully looked into his eyes. Then she lowered her head and said no. Mason was not upset. This is normal. There was no reason to worry. People like you are only interested in their own feelings. Why I should have loved you. With bitterness in her heart and tears in her eyes. She continued to say that you are so good. I am unhappy. And you do not say nice things to me to support me. Whatever happened, everything was on your shoulders. She held his hand. But his hands had already begun to grow cold. And did not convey the love and affection that had been all the time of their life together. Why are you leaving me? What did I do? You're just a bastard. Emma understood that Mason would not return, would not help in any way and would not talk to her. Mason lay in the new virtual world. The project administrator stood in front of him. The girl greeted him and congratulated him on completing the level, surviving the doomsday. He did not understand what had happened to him. He had the feeling that a whole life had been lived. The administrator said that memory loss is normal. This was done in order to prevent the user from confusing reality with a dream world. Over the next month, he will slowly remember what happened to him in that dream. After his mind returns to normal, it will be easier for him to perceive what happened to him in a dream. He seemed to remember something. The administrator looked at him without emotion. He remembered only that he had told himself a million times that he must not forget. He had sadness in his soul, and tears rolled down his face. Mason asked the administrator if this world would exist after he left, but the administrator replied that it was just a game and now the game of Mason's windows, so that he thinks it was just a dream and he has to live in reality. The administrator pointed at the screen with her cane and said that the scoring would now begin. Mason heard the characteristic sound of the program and looked at the screen. On the screen was written, Doomsday Survival Results, Difficulty Level 0, Grade B, and 50 Bonus Points. Grade B, Mason didn't understand why he got such a low score. The administrator replied that the score was based on the chances of survival of those left in this world, alluding to Emma, solving issues with wild animals, access to electricity. These items can increase the companion's chances of survival, and the score goes up. But if you had reliable equipment and enough supplies, or they would set up a broadcasting station to find the survivors, or they could tame wild animals. But Mason said he was just a regular guy and couldn't be that professional. But the administrator said that the game was made to experience things that you can't do in the real world. Doomsday Survival is only a test version of the game with zero difficulty. The official release of the game in a month, it will reflect the main content of the game. The administrator pointed to the screen again. It was written Beast Invasion, a game created to improve the poor humanity with the help of the players. For subsequent games, a countdown will be shown so that players know when from reality they will get into the game. Mason said that he needed to go back and think about whether to play or not, although he did not remember anything. But his heart was sad and very bad, so he did not want to play further. But the administrator said that everything is known in comparison. For example, when Mason made love, he looked quite happy. The administrator pointed her cane at the screen. Mason turned around and saw how he was in bed with Emma. Mason began to cover the screen with himself and screaming that she should not have seen this because she violates the privacy of the players but the administrator said that she was just a control robot and did not feel any emotions. 
Mason asked if Emma had the same memories, to which the administrator replied that she did not have such memories because it was just a virtual game. Mason didn't like the game and asked how he could get out and not play anymore. But the receptionist ignored his question and said that in the real world, he would be able to contact her by rubbing his left eye. She added that he still has a reward that he can use in the real world and he can collect it right now. Mason agreed to receive the award, not in vain did he try, and asked that the award be sent to him by mail to the address of the company in which he works. The administrator waved her cane and everything around Mason began to disappear. Before disappearing, the administrator said that the system will calculate the reward he deserves. Now Mason was standing in a completely black room. Suddenly bloodshot wolf eyes appeared from behind. Mason remembered that he had fought wolves. Fragments of the moments of the fight with the wolves began to come to his mind. Suddenly, a huge wolf appeared, which was ten times larger than Mason. From the back, Mason saw a huge prehistoric man with a spear who was running at the wolf. It was an exemplary scene of how people in ancient times dealt with wild animals. The prehistoric man swung and threw his spear at the wolf. It hit right on target and pierced right through the wolf. Mason's reward is a hunting roll. Mason was lying on his bed. The alarm clock was playing next to him. The clock was exactly seven in the morning. Mason rubbed his left eye in order to call the program, but nothing happened. Mason could not understand if he was in the game or still sleeping or he was in real life. The program administrator does not understand what is happening. She asked the program why she did not start working with Mason when he rubbed his left eye. The program replied that an error had occurred in the system. The memory control function had failed. The administrator gave the command to trace the error code. The error code was number 001. A picture of an error appeared. It was Emma's dream. She dreamed about how she takes a table knife. He approaches Mason's body, swings a knife at him in order to cut off part of the body. The administrator screams that she does not need to remember this. She gives the command to fix the problem, but the system replies that the required patches were not found in the database. The administrator is disappointed because she is an Android administrator, and if she had been given access to program everything herself, such errors would not have happened. Emma wakes up horrified. Doctors standing by the bed ask her if she has regained consciousness. Tears appeared in her eyes, although she did not remember anything, but in her soul she was sad and sad. She turned to the doctors and asked what they were doing in her room. The doctors looked at each other in surprise. One of the doctors said that Emma was sleepwalking last night. Emma tried desperately to remember. The doctor said that Emma went to the kitchen. She took a kitchen knife and kept saying the word, I'm sorry. She remembered Mason's face and tears did not stop rolling down her cheeks. The doctors were worried about what might happen to her and it would be nice for her to rest by taking a few days off. Emma continued to cry and realized that it was not a dream. She did not understand what was happening, but her memories were completely real and were much more than just a dream. Mason went out into the street. Many people walked around him and the city lived its own life. After such a long sleep, which he still remembered only fragments, it was difficult for him to get used to the ordinary world. He went to the coffee shop and the barista asked him, him as always. The barista said that relatives from his hometown wanted to find them a good son-in-law if Mason wanted to meet a beautiful girl. Mason went to the fire and began to warm his hands. The barista was surprised he was cold. Mason smiled stupidly and said that he was a little cold. This dream was quite real and Mason felt it right now. The barista repeated his question about dating a girl, but Mason said with a smile that he already had a girlfriend. He remembered his dream and thought of Emma. Although he did not like the game, he was grateful that he had such happy moments with Emma. He had already reached the office where he worked. At 7.50, Mason was almost late for work. Someone patted him on the shoulder. It was Brother James. Mason was very glad to see him, because now James was not a dressed mannequin, but looked completely alive. Mason said that he was very glad to see him. James did not understand Mason's behavior, because only one night had passed for him. He did not understand that Mason had lived without him for six months. James warned Mason to be careful. There were rumors in the advertising department that the worst employee would be fired. As far as James knew, the company would be creating a new marketing department and their department would be laid off. James said that because of their bad relationship with Eaton, he could be fired first. Mason was not afraid of being fired, especially after everything that had happened to him. He has many options. Why force himself to live by someone else's rules? Mason, you seem to have changed, said James. Mason did not understand him. James said that he usually just complained. He really changed his mindset. Now he is used to being responsible for his own destiny. Mason sat down at his desk and folded his arms. For Mason, it's been so long since he's been at work that he's almost forgotten everything. 
He took out his notebook and began to take notes. First he wanted to call Foytine, then Spite. He stopped. It seemed to him that this plan was not correct. Mason thought the first step would be to collect testimonials from new customers. He tore a sheet out of his notebook and threw it behind his back. The piece of paper fell right into the trash can. Mason was visited by some incomprehensible feeling for him. He tore out another sheet of paper and crumpled it. A few tables away was another trash can. He decided to try to get into it. Mason took aim and threw a crumpled piece of paper. But during the throw, his hand seemed to choose the trajectory and force of the throw. It was incredible and Mason could not believe in his abilities. He remembered that the reward for the game was an ability, a hunter role. Mason could not believe it, because it was just a game. How could she give him the ability to use abilities in real life? He decided to try again, but this time he chose the farthest bin, which was at the end of the corridor. He took aim again and launched the crumpled piece of paper. He hit right at Eaton, who at that time went out into the corridor and fell under the trajectory of the paper. Eaton stopped and told Mason to go into his office. Mason got angry and understood that this was not a good sign, but he himself was to blame for his misconduct. He walked along a long office corridor, and everyone around him understood that this time Mason screwed up. Everyone understood that they would have a reduction in their department, and how hellish devils rejoiced at Mason's misdeed. James looked at Mason's trail with surprise and could not understand what was happening to him today. He went into the office and Eaton told him to sit down. Mason sat down in a chair and was already prepared for the worst. Eaton poured tea with a smile on his face. Mason thought he was glad that he could now fire him for misconduct. Eaton said he really underestimated Mason. He didn't understand what Eaton meant by that. Based on the past communication, Mason was sure that now he would be fired, so he boldly began to speak first. For the past two years, he has been doing his job properly, and today was the only day he made a mistake. Even if he is fired today, he should be paid in full for the past month. But Eaton said that Mason was missing something. Mason was scared. He even thought that Eaton found comments about him on the internet, where Mason called him the most vile words. Eaton stood up abruptly and said with a smile that these two years had been just a test, his training. A new department is being created in the company, and Vice President Liam personally put in a good word for Mason to work there. Mason tried to get out of Eaton's arms and said that he did not know Mr. Liam. But Eaton did not believe him and continued to flatter him, saying that his potential and contribution to the company was simply invaluable. Eaton said that he always considered Mason a good student, and that is why he loaded him with work. Mason said he was about to leave work. Eaton said that he had a great opportunity to grow up the career ladder. In secret, he told Mason that the salary in the new department would increase by 20%, which is why Mason should not go anywhere. Mason, with a smile on his face, left the office and told his friend James about what had happened. Who could not believe in such a turn of events? Mason said that he did not yet know where he could work and agreed with the transfer. Their conversation was overheard by the head of the advertising department and could not contain his indignation. He walked over to the table where Mason and James were sitting. In anger, he began to shout that he had done more for the company than the two of them put together. Eaton came up behind and told him to be quiet. He opened the department doors for Mr. Liam and politely asked him to come in. Mr. Liam was a young, handsome guy with red hair. He heard the shouts of the head of the advertising department and said that there was a lot of hostility in the department. He directly asked the indignant boss if he doubted his choice of employees. The head of the advertising department was sweating from fear and immediately began to quietly say that he never doubted his decisions. Eaton wanted to show his importance to Mr. Liam and sharply criticized the head of advertising and said that today he was no longer the head. The head of the department was completely overwhelmed. Eaton informed everyone that Mason would now be transferred to a new department and his workload would be handled by a new head of publicity. The director of Eaton approached James with an offer to head the advertising department. James said without hesitation that it was an honor for him. The director said that Mason wouldn't have to work today. He could pack his things and get ready to move to a new department. Mason immediately realized that the director intended to impress and most likely because of Mr. Liam. Mr. Liam told Mason that the new department was organizing a party at the end of the day and he should be there. In addition, Mr. For Everyone added that no one would be fired from the advertising department so everyone could continue to work in peace. Mason never even saw Mr. Liam. He did not understand where such concern for him came from. Mr. Liam in turn looked at Mason. He did not understand why Emma asked him to transfer Mason to a new department. A few hours later, James was already in his first meeting as head of advertising. This month, the KPIs of the advertising department were not up to par, 
so he wanted to discuss how to improve them with new subordinates. James carefully looked at his subordinates, who did not listen to him at all, and everyone was minding their own business. James realized that he was being ignored. A former leader approached him and said with a grin that it was not so easy to manage subordinates. Now his friend Mason is not with them, and now no one will support James. The former boss began to bring discord into the team. He said that they had no potential for further growth, so why should they complicate their lives if they can continue to calmly go with the flow? Mason got a call from his mother. She asked him if he was going home for the Chinese New Year. He had not come home for two years. Mason said that he could not come yet, but boasted that today he was promoted, and very soon he would be able to pay off their debts. It was a difficult two years, and my mother thanked him for the money he sent. Unexpectedly, a girl in a light pink dress approached Mason and asked him his name. Mason introduced himself. The girl said that her name is Emily. She is the head of the marketing department. She saw Mason's name on the list of new employees, and she would like to meet him personally. Mason was pleasantly surprised by such a nice team leader. She asked him if he was planning to come to the party tonight. The gathering place happened to be the villa in which Mason lived with Emma, from the world of dreams. Mr. Liam liked to have parties at his house, and the girl kindly offered Mason to take him there. Mason agreed, and could not believe that he was staying at Mr. Liam's house in the dream world. They went to the car, and the girl immediately began to talk about the rules of staying in Mr. Liam's house. He was very attentive to cleanliness, so Mason should pay close attention to this when they dined together. But Mason did not understand what exactly he should pay attention to. One of the examples the girl said that he should clean his souls well before entering the house. Mason immediately remembered how he came to this house after another hunt, and without taking off his boots carried the carcass of a deer directly to the kitchen. Better not use the toilet at Mr. Liam's house, the girl continued. He drifted back into memory when Emma scolded him for not lifting the toilet lid before going to the bathroom, Liam's bedroom. Mason remembered what he and Emma were doing in the bedroom and was delighted, but Emily did not understand his reaction to the rules she had said. Suddenly they heard cries for help. It was a robbery. An unknown man snatched a bag from a woman and tried to escape. Mason immediately understood what he needed to do. He took a package from the girl's hands and was about to throw it at the robber. She tried to stop him because there were important documents in the package and she could not believe that from such a long distance, Mason would be able to hit the robber. The robber jumped over the railing dividing the roadway. Mason realized that this was the right moment and threw a package of documents at him. The package hit exactly in the head of the offender. The impact of the package stunned the offender and he fell to the asphalt. Passersby ran up to the criminal and tied him up, and the girl from whom he stole the bag got it back. Mason, along with Emily, collected the documents that had fallen out of the package. He understood that he had disobeyed Emily by throwing a package of important documents at the criminal, and he expected that she would be angry with him. Emily turned to Mason with admiration. She was not interested in scattered documents. She was amazed at Mason's courage, courage, and accuracy. This hit on the thief amazed her. She was delighted and wanted Mason to teach her. Emily thought that initially during the acquaintance, she was just playing an office manager. But now Mason is a god in her eyes. She admires him. Mason was pleased to hear praise from the girl he liked. Passersby also thanked Mason for his help in catching the criminal. While Mason was collecting Emily's documents, he saw John's business card. He turned to the girl and wanted her to tell why she needed this card. She snatched the card out of his hands and quietly said that this is their most important partner because the owner of this company is from the Global 100 list. Mason could not remember where he heard this name from. The girl said that John is romantically involved with director Emma, and recently they even went on a cruise with him. He remembered when they were at the game, Emma said that it was her boyfriend's name. Mason said that they should hurry because they could be late for dinner. He was a little upset because Emma didn't want to date John. He knew that well, but he consoled himself with the fact that it was just a game. They arrived at Villa. Emily got a message that the banquet was in Villa's backyard. She began to tell Mason how to get to the backyard, but he, not listening to her, went to the entrance. She tried to stop Mason because the villa was huge and she was worried that Mason might get lost. Mason took her by the hand and led her along. A minute later, they were in the backyard. The girl noticed that Mason was behaving too arrogantly, as if he had entered his own house. But this did not bother Mason at all when he saw her. Emma stood in a beautiful evening dress that shone from the sun and near her stood Mr. Liam. Mr. Liam asked everyone to take their seats. The entire marketing department was assembled. Emily hugged Mason and said that they would sit together at the table. He did not expect such hugs from Emily and believed that they should be more restrained at the first meeting. She hugged Mason and asked him about his personal life. 
Emma watched them with her head down in frustration. She still did not remember everything that happened to her in a dream, but she understood that Mason was dear to her. Mr. Liam began to give his opening speech. He talked about how they have a chain of 10 supermarkets, and this time they want to move to online sales. Mason asked why director Emma worked in the marketing department. Emma told him that she was the one who designed and created this department. Emily said that Emma was the chairman's daughter and her status was even higher than Mr. Liam's. Mason asked where Mr. Liam came from because he is so young and already holds the post of vice president. Emily said that Mr. Liam is Emma's childhood friend. They have been close since childhood. Emily said that Mr. Liam is very smart. He is the best student in the school and also a pragmatist. Everyone thought that he and Emma were a very good couple. Mason did not understand why then Emma was dating John. This was some kind of dirty relationship. Emily asked Mason to keep her voice down because they didn't need to know about the lives of these people. But she envied them because she herself wanted to try to be surrounded by successful people. In real life, Mason was heavily in debt and couldn't date Emma, so he wished Emily good luck and that she remembered to take him with her when she gets rich. Mr. Liam finished his opening remarks and now it was time for the fun. Music began to play. It was classical music that kept the atmosphere of peace around. Mr. Liam asked Emma to dance. She did not refuse him because the last time they danced in high school, Mason looked at their dance with bitterness in his eyes. The waiter brought a hot dish. It was a steak. It looked expensive in autumn and could match their monthly salary. Emily offered a drink because Mason looked distant as if he had not seen the world around him for a long time. He agreed that he should relax a bit. But even when he was drinking with Emily, Mason did not stop thinking about Emma, who was dancing with Mr. Liam. He recalled how they had drinks with Emma. These were unforgettable evenings spent with a beautiful girl. Although Emma danced with Mr. Liam, Mason did not get out of her head. The atmosphere in the marketing department was very friendly. Everyone communicated well with each other. Mason listened to the conversation of his colleagues, and they discussed the fact that Mr. Liam and Emma are a great couple. They sat at the same desk for many years, and now they work together. And if they do not get married, then this will be an unforgivable act. Mason thought that Mr. Liam was a man to be trusted. He hoped that Emma could live a good life with him. Thinking, he brought his hands too close to the freshly cooked steak and scalded himself. Emily rose abruptly from her chair and said that he should have been more careful with the hot dish. She quickly approached Mason, squatted in front of him, and began to pour water on his hand. There was nothing serious with the hand, and the burn was supposed to heal in a couple of days. Seeing what was happening, one of the employees of the department said that they had a new couple. Emma looked at them sadly when everyone thought it was fun. Suddenly, the named guests came to the event. It was David, one of John's most influential and closest people, and he said he had come to congratulate Emma on taking office. But he was unhappy that John's fiancé was dancing with another man. Mason asked Emily who this guy was. Emily told him who he was and that he was John's representative. Mr. Liam explained that there was nothing between him and Emma. They were just dancing, because it's normal to enliven the atmosphere at a party with dancing. Emma began to flatter David to divert his attention from what she saw. She thanked him for being able to attend their party. David stared at Emma's breasts, her dress only accentuating her curvaceous figure. Emma invited David to come to her company office tomorrow if he wanted to discuss work matters. David said that since he came to the party, he would like to take part in it too. He invited Emma to dance, since they have such an opportunity as part of the holiday. Mr. Liam wanted to stand up for Emma and said that they were just old acquaintances, so they danced together. Therefore, Emma should not dance with an unfamiliar David. David was much higher in status than Mr. Liam, so he asked him not to think too much about it, because it was just a dance, after which he corrected himself and said with disdain that Mr. Liam should not think much at all. Mr. Liam could not answer anything and stood silently. Emma took Liam by the shoulder and pushed him aside to defuse the situation. She said that Mr. David was their partner and they should be more forgiving. David approved of her behavior and invited her to dance. Emma had no choice but to agree. Emily talked about how dishonest it was. It was disgusting to watch them dance. David told Emma that John's boss had arranged everything and that he had come to set up a meeting with her. Emma thanked David for his help. She absolutely did not want this, but she had no choice. She had to meet John and then marry him because her father wanted so. David said that his help was not worth a thank you and pulled Emma close to him. But Emma pushed him away and told him not to overstep the bounds in the dance. David apologized, but his apology was not sincere. It was just a game. David was well aware that Emma was marrying John only because he was unheard of rich. Mr. Liam was on the edge. He loved Emma, 
but also understood that his social status was not enough to date the beautiful Emma. He was filled with anger as he watched Emma dance with David. David began to lower his hand to Emma's buttocks, but she tore his hand away from her and screamed that he was a disgusting dancer. David began to apologize again and insisted on continuing the dance because he had not danced for a long time. Emily was ashamed to look at this because with this dance, David humiliated not only Emma, but also Mr. Liam. David only thought that Emma was just a two-faced bitch and he wouldn't mind making love to her either. But David could see that Emma didn't give him a single hint, which made him angry. During the dance, David decided to step on her dress, which he did with a smile on his face. Emma pushed him away from her. One strap of the dress was torn off. At the same moment, a piece of hot fried steak flew into the air. It landed right in front of David's eyes. Emma fell to the pavement and David jumped in pain. David called his guards and told them to find whoever threw the piece of meat at him. One of the guards walked over to the table where Mason and Emily were sitting, but each of them had a piece of meat on a plate. Luckily, Emily put half of her cut of meat on Mason's plate. Emily did not expect such an act from Mason because even Mr. Liam did not dare to do anything to David and Mason acted like a man. Emily liked Mason more and more. Two guards walked around all the tables, but everyone had a piece of meat. David ordered them to search further until they found the culprit, because a piece of meat could not fall on his head from the sky. Suddenly, Emma, helped up by Mr. Liam, slapped David in the face. From the blow, David fell to the pavement. Emma held onto the strap of her dress and told David to get out of their party. Mason looked at her and did not believe that Emma could flare up so much. He was glad that he did not find this in the game. David got up and was furious. He was embarrassed in front of everyone. He could not just leave it like that. Mr. Liam intervened and told him to behave or he would call the police. David couldn't calm down. His guard whispered something in his ear. After that, David came to his senses and said that they would see each other tomorrow. Mr. Liam did not think that David would make concessions. Emma asked him not to pay attention to this because she needed to change clothes. And so the party ended, but Emily still had plans. Here she and Mason were sitting in a bar Emily said that she did not like it when Mason called her the head of the department. She asked to be called by her name. Emily couldn't believe that she met a guy who was more attractive than Mr. Liam. Not yet married. Mason was the one she needed. She was already planning to make love to him today. Mason said he didn't really want to drink today. He had only $400 and there was still a week before payday. Emily thought she had a stubborn guy and she needed to fight for him. The girl said she didn't want to drink alone so she offered a deal. She drinks three drinks and he has one. Mason agreed. He thought he could get her drunk quickly and spend less money on snacks. It was already midnight on the clock. Mason tried to wake up Emily. He wanted to know where she lives so he could take her home. As soon as Emily woke up, she immediately began to dance and Mason realized that she should not drink anymore. She stood on the table and spun a little. Unable to stand on the table, Emily fell right on Mason. Her chest was right on Mason's face. Mason wanted to get up quickly, but this position suited Emily. She began to gently play with her tongue at his ear and stretch his shirt with your right hand. She lay completely on top of him and touched his body in such a way that it caused him an extraordinary surge of arousal. The bartender approached them and awkwardly said that he did not want to interrupt them, but the institution is now closed. The bartender handed over the check. Mason was horrified because their evening cost exactly $400. Mason did not know where Emily lives, so he brought her to his home. Emily came to her senses a little and asked Mason where he was taking her, to which Mason replied that he did not know where she lives, so he brought her to his home. Emily said that Mason is a naughty one. He only knows her for one day and already takes her to his house. Mason asked her to tell her where she lives, and then he would take her home in a taxi. But Emily didn't want to eat at home and didn't mind staying at Mason's. Mason did not pay attention, but an unknown man was watching them in his apartment. Mason carefully laid the exhausted and graceful Emily on his bed. She gently asked to hug her, and her eyes shone with longing and expectation. But Mason, resisting the exciting desire, refused, asking her to just lie down and calm down. Mason wanted to avoid a possible scandal, especially given his recent move to a new department. Emily reported that she felt dizzy and dizzy, as if she was on the verge of fainting. She slowly began to rise from the bed. Her movements were weak, barely audible. She stood up vulgarly, seductively, as if playing her own game of seduction. Then she boldly stood in front of Mason, gently kneeling down. Taking him by the shoulders, she threw him gracefully onto the bed, causing a wave of energy and passion. Her breasts gently like a sigh clung to Mason's face, bewitching him with her skillful seduction. 
Emily decided to start the last battle while her mind gradually cleared up. She sat dominatingly on top of him, enjoying the spectacle of how long he could maintain the facade of an obedient boy. Mason, standing on the verge of excitement, restrained his passions with the last remnants of strength. Emily untied her seductive dress and her bare, ample breasts remained covered with only one bra. Mason grabbed her hand and quietly warned that if they continued in this direction, they would face serious obstacles. Emily let out a playful chuckle and stated that Mason himself was beginning to feel a passionate fire burning around them. She slowly began to unfasten the belt on his trousers, sliding her fingers smoothly over the strong fabric. Whispering in Mason's ear in a low voice, she urged him to relax and let her take control. Mason could not understand how a young and healthy guy is able to withstand such a whirlwind of passion and excitement. But at a certain moment, Emily stopped and fell silent, as if surrendering to the power of sleep. He slowly turned to face her, a smile playing on his lips, as he realized that she had fallen asleep, lying comfortably and calmly on top of him. Mason covered her with a blanket while she fell sweetly into his bed. It was already two o'clock in the morning and today Mason had to sleep on the couch. He was almost asleep when he heard the sound of the door opening. Getting up a little from the bed, Mason saw an unfamiliar man in his apartment. The man stood beside Emily's bed, pulling off her shorts. He looked forward to further pleasure. Mason went into Emily's room to stop him. Mason loudly asked who he was and how he got here. The man was calm and asked Mason not to scream. He said that the girl was drunk and he wanted to have some fun with her. Mason could not believe his ears. How could an outsider get to his house, behave so calmly, and still take advantage of his girlfriend? Mason could not stand running up to the man and tried to strangle him. But the stranger was clearly stronger and more experienced than Mason, so he easily threw Mason over himself, cooling his ardor. While Mason was lying on the floor, the stranger said that he was quite strong, but he didn't want any trouble. The stranger sat down on Emily's bed again and began to take off her panties. He told Mason that he would owe him for allowing him to have fun with Emily. The stranger offered Mason to wait until he had money, after which he would pay him for the girl, because he had not touched women for 20 years. The stranger had already completely removed Emily's panties and threw them on Mason's face. Mason told him that he was a completely sick bastard. He took a nearby chair and began to attack the stranger with it. But the stranger was strong, and with one blow of his hand he broke the chair into small pieces. The stranger was indestructible and still felt calm, looking forward to how he was toying with Emily. Mason did not know what to do, but since he did not manage to stop the stranger himself, he decided to call the police. He said that breaking and entering for the purpose of rape was severely punished by law. Mason almost started dialing the number, but the stranger was more afraid of this than of the chair, so he hurriedly stopped Mason. The stranger said that he had not been in the country for almost 20 years, and he did not know what the principles were now, because before such possession of women was a normal phenomenon. Mason didn't trust the man, and he didn't impress Mason with his excuses. The stranger said that this was his house 20 years ago, and he returned to collect what was hidden here. He went to the corner of the room and began to feel the floor. At some point, one of the boards wobbled and he picked it up. There really was a hiding place. The stranger was surprised that no one had found the box he left 20 years ago. The box was full of jewelry. The stranger said that 20 years ago, this apartment was full of prostitutes and gold and no one even dared to bend down to take the gold lying on the floor, because if the girl wanted gold, she could only remove it from her finger with her mouth. Mason listened to him carefully, but at the same time said that he did not care about his past life. But the stranger again asked him not to call the police because he stopped in time and did practically nothing. The stranger said that he had his own rules of life, and he was not at all a hooligan bastard. Mason said that in a good way he should call the police and tell about what happened. The stranger said that Mason might be a man of honor. But even if he told the police, for the gold, Emily would say that it was Mason who molested her and not a stranger. The man took out a small box from his hiding place and handed it to Mason, asking him to forget it. What happened between them? Mason did not need his handouts, but the stranger said that the ring which is in the box is iron and in itself is worth nothing. But in fact, this ring is very unusual. From the day the stranger took possession of him, he dreamed of only one woman. She was wearing a red coat, holding a golden cane and blue eyes. But the stranger could not remember where he saw her and what she told him. But he clearly remembered that this woman had beaten him. Mason understood that the stranger was talking about the program administrator. The stranger went to the exit and advised Mason not to throw away the ring because it could be useful to him. The stranger had already left and slammed the door behind him. Mason looked at the box and thought that this ring was definitely connected with the dream system. 
When he opened the box, the ring with the red stone in the middle glowed brightly. His left eye activated the program, but this program was somehow different from the usual dream system. In front of him was a hologram of a girl in a white suit. She greeted Mason and said that she was the developer of the dream system. Due to the strong pressure, she could only leave such a message. She wanted to warn Mason that he is trapped. The dream system erases the boundaries of social class, law and morality in reality. After the game, it is difficult for users to find that their perception of the real world is changing. The break with reality in the dream system leads to degradation, greed, violence and criminal inclinations. Other developers like to play with the fate of man and she cannot convince them to return the game system to be finalized. With this warning, she hopes to warn Mason to be attentive to his changes and not fall into lust. At each level, the developer left tools that will help Mason get rid of the system. He had to find it in the game. After saying that, the message was interrupted. Mason was at a loss. The developer looked the same as the administrator. Mason thought that he was quite normal and would not break the law. Mason thought that this man met a girl 20 years ago, and he discovered the game as soon as he moved here, so this ring is the console to run the game. He put the ring back in the box, and at that moment, the alarm rang. The clock was exactly seven in the morning. Emily suddenly woke up. She sat up on the bed, but was surprised to find that she had no panties on. Half an hour later, they were already going to work together. Emily hugged Mason with admiration. Mason, as always, went to the coffee shop, and the barista finally understood why he did not want to get acquainted with his relative, since Mason came with the barista's girlfriend and said that everything was at the expense of the establishment for them today. They walked into the office building in an embrace. Employees among themselves discussed their joint appearance. Emily had been in love with a former head of the advertising team for a long time, and the fact that Emily came to the office today with Mason made him very angry. Emily suggested that Mason go to the cinema tonight. She knew a good cinema which only couples can go to, and was glad that now she could visit it. Mason didn't have any money at all, but he didn't know how to hint at this to Emily, so he saw only one way out, to borrow some money from his best friend. Emma walked towards them. She was dressed in an elegant beige dress that perfectly emphasized her luxurious body shape. They greeted each other, but Mason could not look Emma in the eyes, remembering what happened between them. Emma looked at them closely and said that their relationship is developing quite quickly. Emma also remembered her dream perfectly. It seemed to her that Mason was rather slow, but he started dating Emily so quickly that he even impressed Emma. Emily said with a smile that just last night she thought he was a very modest person, but he managed to lull her vigilance. Mason was shocked by what Emily said and stopped her from saying something superfluous. Emily's words already hooked Emma, from which she tensed up a lot. She couldn't say anything, because she didn't know that Mason also remembered her dream, but her feelings for him were still strong. Holding back her emotions, Emma said that she was happy for them, but they were at work, and their relationship should not affect their work schedule in any way. Emily asked why Principal Emma was so interested in their relationship. She both wanted to limit it and encouraged it. Mason said that first of all they should work, and only then deal with personal relationships. Emily let go of his hand and was offended that his girlfriend didn't want to hear this from her boyfriend. He shouldn't have supported the director Emma. Emily said that now Mason is not alone and he should think of them as family unless, of course, he just wanted to fool around. Mason agreed with her words, confirming that they are now close to each other and he should be more kind to Emily. These words cheered up Emily. She regained her mood. She hugged Mason and said that she would be waiting for him after work on the first floor. As soon as they parted the hugs, Emily took his hand and put it on her buttocks, because next time she wanted Mason to take the initiative himself. Mr. Liam was in the same office as Emma. She was depressed from what she saw this morning. Mr. Liam asked what was wrong with her mood. She coldly replied that she had a lot of work due to the opening of a new department. Mr. Liam came closer to her and said that he had known her for many years, and she would not be able to deceive him. He knew that Emma was excited about something. He went to the table and hit it with both hands. Mr. Liam directly asked if she was upset about Mason. She was still cold and said without showing emotion that she did not understand what he was talking about. At that moment, Mason entered the office. He reported to Mr. Liam that he had finished the report. Just in time, said Mr. Liam, and invited him into the office. Emma tensed even more. Mr. Liam studied the report. It was clean, neat and clear at a glance. Emma and Mason did not look at each other and were as tense as possible. Both experienced each other's feelings. Mr. Liam asked Mason why he was sad because he praised his report. Mason said he was just staring at a potted plant. At first he looked at it, 
having absolutely no idea what kind of plant was in front of him. But in the next second, his heart began to beat much faster, as if it caught the excitement hiding inside Mason. And suddenly a vivid picture surfaced in his memory. It was a tomato seedling. Emma got up anxiously and put down the keyboard, peering at Mason with interest. Her eyes sparkled with hope as she asked him if he had seen a similar plant anywhere else before. Mason replied that this plant is connected with many of his memories, as if pierced by a thin thread of time. Vivid images began to appear in his head, where Emma, in their native garden, was planting and watering seedlings, resolutely drives away rats from them. The last tomato they had left during the days of hunger and exhaustion surfaced in their memory, and Mason's heart sank from the memories. Emma's heart was filled with hope that this was not just a dream, and she was looking forward to hearing from Mason about where he had seen this mysterious plant. In Mason's chest, his heart began to beat even stronger, and sadness covered his eyes like a thick fog. He began to remember the words of his boss, that everyone is destined to have their place in this world. The words of the administrator of the game, who said that everything that happened to him was just an illusion. Mason remembered the words of the game developer, who warned him not to confuse reality with the game. He remembered Emily, who looked hopefully into his eyes and said that they were now a real family. Mason faced a difficult choice. Doubts and fear filled his soul. He could already throw himself into the arms of Emma, who with hope in her eyes was waiting for this. Despite the social status, Mr. Liam, other employees who would simply not understand his behavior. For all the time spent in this virtual reality, Mason fell in love with Emma with all his being. Although he did not remember everything that happened to them, but his soul and body could not be deceived or deprived of memory. Everything around froze in anticipation of Mason's answer, as if with bated breath. The flames of fear and confusion melted his heart, drenching his face in beads of sweat as Mason struggled to articulate what was churning in his soul. Mason lowered his head and forced out that it was a plant he had often seen as a child when he lived in his hometown. Mr. Liam looked at Mason in disbelief, seeing his agitation, and said that judging by his emotions, this plant, which is connected to Mason's past, hides something much deeper and more meaningful. Mason tried to break the tension and quickly defended himself, claiming that it was impossible to hide any secrets behind ordinary tomatoes. Looking at Emma, Liam noticed that she was also tense, although she was trying to hide her emotions, and he asked her why she was even growing tomatoes in the office. Emma was confused and didn't know how to answer correctly, and various options flashed through her mind as she tried to find the words. But Emma was adept at handling difficult situations, and she smiled, saying that she just messed up the seeds and didn't pay attention to the plant until it grew so big. Mr. Liam laughed, and Mason was relieved that he had done the right thing, because no one suspected that he was the only one who remembered this dream. Mr. Liam was reassured by the report, and although Mason was enjoying his work, his mental turmoil still weighed heavily on him. After this emotional strain, he went to the bathroom to wash his face with cold water, if only for a little while to get rid of thoughts about his long sleep. Liam also came out of Emma's office, and her face was now clearly showing real emotions. Tears trickled down Emma's cheeks, and she thought about how hard it was to hide her emotions, but she knew that if she didn't hold back, no one would understand and accept this situation. Mason turned off the faucet and pondered, realizing that the game developer was right and he had fallen into a trap from which it would be difficult for him to get out. You could do anything you wanted in the game, and he wondered what would happen to him if he got used to killing, hunting, or even having Emma around, and how would it affect his real life. As he buttoned up the top button of his shirt, Mason reflected on his situation. Since he was only a junior employee of the company, and she was the daughter of the director himself, the probability of their meeting in the future seemed extremely small. Emma glanced at the sprouting tomatoes and realized that the dreams they shared seemed so real, as if they'd lived their entire lives together. But they were just dreams, and she should forget about them. Both of them knew that everything that had happened to them was just a fantasy, a dream that was better not to remember. But neither of them knew that this dream was one for both of them. It was dusk, and the shadow of the office building swallowed up employees heading home to various parts of the city. Mason had a deep-seated feeling that he had found something special with Emily by his side, and he turned to his friend James in embarrassment and asked for a loan of some money. Like magic, Emily was waiting for him outside the office, and her presence filled Mason with warmth and joy. As the elevator slowly descended, Mason considered the idea of spending the first part of the evening eating dinner, then going to the movies and immersing himself in a world of fantastic adventures. 
As Mason stepped outside, his eyes went to Emily, but they were interrupted by the sight of a scene that immediately narrowed his heart. Emily talking to a former advertising executive whose desire to win her attention had been traced back over the years. She was clearly trying to avoid him, trying to stop the conversation, but he was insistent on continuing. Mason approached them with a sense of unease, caught up in curiosity, and asked what was going on here. Immediately he turned to Emily, worried about whether this young man was molesting her, her head bowed, and she confessed that he just wanted to talk. The former boss intervened, uttering words laced with mockery, warning Emily not to get involved with a liar and hypocrite like Mason. With that, he turned and left, leaving behind a hint that now that Emily knew the whole truth, she should make the right decision. The negative impression of these words pierced Emily's heart, and she was depressed on the verge of breaking down. But Mason urged her not to pay attention, claiming that this man always tried to harm him. Mason gently took her hand and suggested that they start the evening with dinner before going to the movies, hoping to overcome the tension and reconnect. However, she quickly dodged, avoiding his touch. Emily's heart was heavy, and with regret, she admitted that it was better for them to part. Mason turned away, his gaze moving into the distance, meeting the sunset that reflected his inner emptiness. All of a sudden, Emily said that despite the guy's personality, they weren't honest with each other, so she immediately asked what his family's duty was. Mason turned to her and whispered that they owed her $200,000. However, such a huge sum was exorbitant for people, ordinary workers like them, and Emily shivered in fright, feeling uneasy. Mason looked at her with a sad, regretful expression and asked her again if she was sure she wanted to leave. She replied that she was just a simple girl from an ordinary family and didn't have the ability to help him. Mason was upset because he could see that what mattered to her was money and debt, not love, a word that didn't matter to her. Embarrassment overcame Emily, and she asked Mason to forget about what had happened between them, saying that she simply wasn't good enough for him. Thinking back to the times when Mason had behaved strangely with another girl named Emma, she wondered if maybe he was just trying to attract the attention of his superiors to solve his financial problems. And as quickly as their romance had begun, it came to an end, and Mason felt the words fall apart between them, leaving only a bitter sense of frustration and emptiness. It was late in the evening and Mason was on his way home. This isn't the first time this situation has happened to him. When he was in college, his first love left him for the same reason. With a bitter feeling in his heart, Mason slowly climbed the stairs of his house. It seemed to him that the debt that constantly closed his mouth haunted Mason throughout his life. He once wanted to start a business, but never found a project that would attract his attention. Mason was surprised when he entered the apartment. Something was cooking on the kitchen stove, and at first he thought he'd forgotten to turn it off. But when he went to the kitchen, he saw the same intruder who claimed that many years ago this was his apartment. The stranger's face was covered in bruises and cuts, and he greeted Mason calmly, as if his presence in the apartment was natural. His behavior infuriated Mason. After that, he attacked him with screams and shaking him with all his might, asked how he got here again. On this day, Mason was always accompanied by nervous stress, and this time he just broke down. He shouted at a stranger that this was no longer his home, this time the stranger didn't offer any resistance. He asked Mason to calm down, because today he didn't find a job and he just had nowhere to go. Mason in anger pushed the stranger out of the apartment door. He did not listen to him at all, and said that if he appeared in the apartment again, he would call the police. Closing the doors, Mason closed the door and calmed down a little, because today his day was full of troubles. After that, his gaze drifted to the pot bubbling on the kitchen stove, and Mason was curious to see what the stranger wanted to cook. When he opened the pot, a strange brown liquid was bubbling in it. Mason had never seen such a dish before and doubted the edibility of this creation. A few minutes later, the apartment door opened again from the inside. Mason turned to the stranger with an incredibly pleased face. He asked the stranger to come inside for a moment. A frustrated stranger sitting on the landing was surprised by Mason's behavior. Mason beckoned the stranger over to the pot of food. When the stranger approached, Mason simply shouted with delight and delight in the prepared dish. They both calmed down a little. Mason said that with such skills he could easily get a job in any restaurant. The stranger looked at Mason with a smile, finally introduced himself. His name was Logan, and also said that he had spent most of his life in prison. Logan spent the whole day looking for a job, but because he doesn't understand smartphones, resumes, and of course because of his criminal record, no one wants to take him. Mason looked at Logan with interest and asked if he was interested in working with him because he had been planning to open his own restaurant for a long time. Logan confidently replied that as long as Mason wasn't interested in his criminal record, 
he was willing to work with him. Mason said that he wasn't interested in what Logan had been doing before they met, but that starting next week, he would start buying everything he needed. Logan asked Mason again as he left if he was sure he didn't want to know what his criminal record was because so many people were afraid of him. But Mason wasn't one of those traitors who broke the terms of a deal. He wasn't interested in his past, and Logan, in turn, was working for him. The game had taught him long ago that if a man wanted meat, he would have to tame a wolf. And if a tamed wolf wants meat, it won't dare attack the hand that feeds it. If that's the case, then we'll be partners, Logan said. Mason immediately asked Logan where the jewels were hidden, because they could immediately invest them in the startup capital. Logan scratched his beard and said that he had recently met a beautiful girl who he wanted to have fun with, and it turned out to be expensive, so he gave her everything he had. Mason couldn't believe what he was hearing. He couldn't have imagined that so much jewellery could be lost so quickly. He had hoped so much for these jewels. The money he had saved up was clearly not enough to open his own restaurant. Mason's phone rang. He heard Emily's voice on the phone. Mason was angry with her, and he didn't understand why she reminded him of herself again, because he had just switched to other thoughts. Her voice was shaky, and she apologized to Mason for saying too much today. Mason did not want to listen to her pathetic excuses and asked her to quickly end the conversation, because he was no longer interested in communicating with her. Emily had said that she wanted to help him, that she had found a way to make money quickly, but Mason wasn't ready to hear that. Meanwhile, at the company's office, Mr. Liam was in Emma's office. He said that he was very happy with the new employee Mason because he gave him a whole week's work and he did everything in one day and very well. Liam now calmly said that he was wrong about Emma and Mason having feelings because Mason was a really talented employee. Emma asked him not to suspect her, not to think that he knew everything about her, or she should remind him how many secretaries she had already fired. At the same time, a receptionist carefully entered the office and warned Mr. Liam that the car was waiting for him downstairs. You'll remember a ray of sunshine. Emma, as usual, didn't like Liam's new secretary, and neither did their ongoing sexual relationship. Liam turned to Emma and told her that they had agreed not to interfere in each other's personal lives, so she didn't have to worry about his secretaries. Mason was walking through the city at night to meet Emily. He was very uncomfortable, and he didn't understand how he could have believed her so quickly about making a quick living. Finally, he found Emily standing in the street with her friends, the fat one named Becca and the skinny one named Barbara. Mason immediately noticed their extravagant appearance and asked why they were dressed like this. Barbara immediately explained that clothing attracts the attention of viewers, and the more viewers on the stream, the more profit they will receive. Mason immediately asked if he needed to dress like this and what he needed to do, to which Barbara replied that his clothes were already ready and his main task would be throwing darts. Emily added that they already have 2,000 subscribers and the income from the stream will be divided equally. Mason needed the money, was willing to do anything for the money, and was already changing into the clothes that had been prepared for him. The girls in the next room were discussing their preparations for the stream, and Barbara immediately asked Emily why she had called this guy, because their channel was created to show their attractiveness, and not throw darts. Barbara suggested that it would be too boring content, but Emily was at a loss to justify herself, and assumed that the audience would like it. Becca said that everything had to be agreed with them first, and then they had to call just anyone because they created the channel together. But Becky already had a plan for them to catch the wave of popularity. She was counting on Mason not being able to agree to their offers. So either he would leave or they would make a really good stream. Mason came out of the dressing room. The girls froze in surprise. Mason was wearing leather pants, a hat, and a belt with a ring in the middle of his chest designed for role-playing sex games, and his face was covered with a mask. Barbert said it was exactly what they needed, but why would he need a mask? Becca assumed it was so that no one would recognize him. Mason said that he did not want this stream to affect his personal life in the future. Emily barely managed to say that the rules had changed a little, but he would understand a little later. Becca said with a smile that now, instead of just throwing darts, he would be electrocuted. Emily was very worried about Mason and said that the force of the blows was minimal. Mason was willing to do anything for the money and he said with confidence that he was ready to start. Emily turned on her phone and streamed on YouTube. Becca and Barbara immediately appeared in the frame and told subscribers that something new and exciting was waiting for them today. This time they are putting on a death challenge. Electric dart throwing, as they may notice, they have a metal grid under tension. And of course the target, and if the participant misses, he is electrocuted. Becca decided to demonstrate what would happen to a piece of meat if it was thrown on the electric grid. 
As soon as the meat touched the net, it immediately began to crack and melt like in a frying pan. And now it's time to demonstrate the participant of this test. His name is Pervert, and it is he who will be on the verge of death today. Ten darts will be used. If you like the look of a pervert, subscribe to us. Write about it in the comments and support us with a like, Becca said. The girls were simply delighted with the huge number of viewers and the rapid rise in popularity. But Emily only thought that she needed to make less electric voltage. She still had feelings for Mason, and she couldn't let him get hurt. Just as Emily was trying to ease the tension, Becca stopped her. She didn't want them to be seen as a garbage studio that was deceiving the audience. The game was already beginning. Emily tried to convince Becca to lower the tension because it could really kill him. But Becca was only concerned about the viewings. The main thing is to earn money and retain views and everything else can wait, Becca said. She started yelling at Mason because if he thought money was easy to make, he was clearly wrong. If he doesn't agree to play fair, he can leave right away because there will be no turning back. Mason picked up one of the darts and threw it at the board. The dart flew past, barely touching Becky's hair. Then I hit exactly in the center of the target. Mason gave Becca a confident look and said it was high time to start. She couldn't believe he'd just hit the target because that wasn't what she'd expected. Becca started talking to the audience and said that after the first hit, you can increase the distance. Emily tried to intervene because the international championships use this distance, but Becca didn't care. And she shouted at Emily threateningly, saying that this was her broadcast. Mason didn't want to listen to the women's screams, so he stepped back a little. He picked up the dart again and threw it at the target, again exactly on target. It was amazing. Even the girls were delighted with his accuracy, not to mention all the viewers on the air. Mason didn't stop, and with every backward step, he threw. The number of viewers and subscribers increased exponentially. Mason, on the other hand, was well aware that having his gift after the first dream, he simply could not miss, and he was sure of his uniqueness. Becca had hoped that Mason would get a few electric shocks that day, which might appeal to the audience, but he didn't miss. She continued to comment on the pervert's incredible hits, and the distance was already twice as long as at the World Championship, with only six shots left. This is the fifth accurate throw, and he continues to increase the distance. Sixth hit in a row. The figures for all indicators continued to increase. Excellent seventh hit. The pervert was already at the door, and there was nowhere else to go. Would he open the door and walk on? but suddenly the darts fell to the floor. Becca didn't understand why he'd stopped. The pervert turned to the audience. He asked them if they knew that the studio wanted his success to be doomed. He didn't like it, and he didn't want to participate in it anymore. I don't understand why people like it when someone fails, and I probably don't fit the bill for this business, the pervert said. Therefore, the performance is over. Mason opened the door and left the studio. The stream was stopped. The girls were confused by what happened, but suddenly, all the comments disappeared. They didn't understand why, and Becca assumed it was probably because of her inhumane attitude. But looking at the results of the stream, Barbara and Emily opened their mouths, not understanding what was happening. Dawn was just beginning to break outside. Mason was still asleep because of his late adventure, but an unexpected call came to his phone. It was Emily who said just four words, Mason, you went viral. Mason quickly realized that he didn't understand how he had become popular. He immediately thought that it was because of his clothes. When Mason got dressed and left his room, he was surprised. There was black rice porridge and a variety of snacks on the table. Logan stood in the kitchen and said it was his favorite breakfast combo. Mason didn't even know what to say, even though he hadn't tasted anything. But the appearance of these dishes wasn't very good. He thanked Logan for his concern, but also said that there was no hurry, since the restaurant was still a long time away from opening. But that didn't sit well with Logan, who'd thought the opening would only take a couple of days. Mason knew exactly what he'd said to Logan, but he also knew that he didn't have any money at all. Logan was counting on opening a restaurant. He needed a small income because he wanted to start the life of a simple working man. A short time later, Mason was outside his office. Emily and her friends were already waiting for him there. Mason didn't want to talk to them and tried to just walk around them, but the girls wouldn't let him through. They begged him to give them a chance. This time he managed to escape, but now they met him at the entrance to the office, and if this continues, they may be waiting for him near the house. When Mason was already in the office, one of his partners told him that Mr. Liam was waiting for him in his office. Mason asked why Liam was calling him, to which his partner replied that Liam was interested in the guy in the YouTube video YouTube. His partner showed him the phone, and Mason saw himself in the preview. Mason couldn't believe his eyes. Did this video spread so much? Wasn't this guy called a pervert? Mason asked. My partner said that the guy in the video made seven accurate hits yesterday. 
so they gave him the nickname Seven. Mason went into Mr. Liam's office. Liam abruptly walked over to him, closed the door, and pinned him against the wall. He knew Mason was on last night's broadcast, but he asked why he wasn't in the picture. Seven is a very attractive guy, isn't he? said Mr. Liam. Mason didn't know where to go, because he was getting closer and closer to him, and he was almost pinning him to the wall with his body. Liam said Mason had his phone number and now they could sign him. Mason said that he thought Seven was disgusting, but Liam didn't pay attention to his words because Seven is now on the verge of becoming an industry idol. He was absolutely unfathomable, proud and noble, and many people even started using his quotes, Mr. Liam said. Liam said that now you can make a lot of money on it and forget about morals. He just needs to find the contact details of the Seven. But Mason didn't want to do that and said it wasn't his job. But it didn't interest Mr. Liam. He said that if Mason put him in touch with Seven, he would become his assistant, which would dramatically increase his salary and position in the company. Mason dutifully said that he would complete the task at all costs, and now he understood how people felt about his video character. Meanwhile, Becca and Barbara were sitting on the street, upset that they had offended Mason by their behavior. Suddenly, they saw Emily and Mason walking toward them. Without waiting for them to reach them, Becca sprinted toward them. She grabbed Mason and began to scold him, because she didn't like dressing up like that either. And she used to shoot fitness blogs in general, but no one watched them. And this show is the only way for her to earn money. Yesterday, she didn't want to hurt him, but just wanted to show him how difficult it is to make such content. But his words brought her to her senses. She began to beg Mason. She fell to her knees and with tears in her eyes asked to be given the opportunity to earn money. Mason took her hands and lifted her from her lap. He smiled and said that if they want to make money, they need to start right now. Becca, as well as the other girls, beamed with happiness and such joyful news. One month later, in a dream, Mason received an urgent warning that the game would start tomorrow. This message rather upset Mason because dreams no longer attracted him. After all, now his real life has turned into a dream. Mason stood on stage and asked his fans who was hungry. One of the fans shouted the loudest. Emily brought a cake onto the stage. She was ready to treat everyone. In the blink of an eye, the cake hit the fan right in the face. Mason asked him what the cake tasted like. The fan roared with delight that it was amazing, and the crowd cheered. Emma, who was sitting in the best seats, told Liam that the show was too vulgar for her, to which Liam replied that this is the point, because they need to earn money, and the audience likes it. And now the most interesting part of the show began, when Seven throws a red scarf, and the one who gets the scarf will become his friend for the whole night. Liam started cheering, just like all the other fans. As the crowd cheered, the scarf hit Emma squarely in the face. Emma took off her scarf and asked the people around her who wanted it back. Immediately, a battle ensued between them for that precious red scarf and for the night with the seven. Liam came out of this fight with the scarf. The show was over, and it was deep into the night. Liam and Emma were standing in front of the seven. Liam showed me the scarf and said that he just admired the creativity of the seven. Seven thanked Liam for his dedication and said that Mason had told him that the company wanted to sign a contract with him. But Seven would not do it, but he did not refuse to cooperate and could create advertising for a fee. Suddenly, someone interrupted their conversation and came closer and closer. It was David, and he immediately said that if he were the Seven, he would have chosen his corporation. But Seven immediately said that he refused, without even listening to David finish. John laughed because he would increase Liam's offer by five times, and no one had ever turned it down before. Emma objectively understood that no one would be able to refuse such an offer, although she understood that first they offered a lot of money, and then they set terrible conditions for cooperation. But Seven said that his reluctance does not depend on the amount of money. Then David said he didn't understand what the problem was. Seven said he didn't like David as a person. David froze at the public humiliation. Seven said his goodbyes and started to leave. And it was at this point that David's threatening shouts began to ring David out after him. Liam turned to Emma and told her, self-congratulating, that he was right, and that Seven was simply adorable. Emma really hadn't expected such a reaction, and said that her opinion of the Seven had improved quite a bit. Mason came home and threw a bank card on the table. Logan asked if he'd managed to get enough money to open a restaurant. Mason said it should be just enough for the opening, but Logan said that the rent would have to be paid immediately for three months, because he didn't have enough money. But at the same time, Mason took a second card out of his pocket and handed it to Logan. He said that when he was one year old, his parents put $1,000 on the card and at the age of two, another thousand dollars. Despite the fact that my parents had huge debts, by the time I was 18, I already had $18,000 on my card. 
Then the father gave the card and said that a bird in a cage will not live a long life, so you need to find your own way in life. That money meant a lot to Mason, just like making the decision to open a restaurant. Mason asked, are you ready for the opening? Logan waited a minute and said he couldn't open the restaurant. His words startled Mason. But why, since they had been working on this for so long? Logan felt ashamed and said that he had found another job and Mason had better keep his money until better times. Meanwhile, Mason's former boss was reporting to David that the seven were Mason and showing him the supporting photos. David called over his security chief and asked if he had anyone willing to take on the dirty work. The head of security said that his friend was recently released and is ready to take on any paid job. David stared at the picture of Mason dressing up as a seven-piece with hatred in his eyes. It's time to settle the score. Some time passed. An elderly woman he didn't recognize knocked on Mason's door. He was already on the street, and at first he wanted to go up to her and ask her who she was looking for, but Mr. Liam hurried him out of the car. He quickly ran to the car and got in. Liam asked Mason who had visited him, to which he replied that the woman must have been looking for his neighbor, but he had already moved out. Liam said Mason should find a better place to live, and with his poor salary, he could afford to buy his own place. Mason asked him again, so he had already passed the test stage. Liam was delighted with the meeting with the seven that Mason had organized. Liam introduced Mason to his driver and secretary. They greeted Mason with smiles on their faces. Mason greeted them back and asked them where they were going next. Liam said they needed to meet another girl. Together they need to win her trust. Her name was Melanie, a young, gorgeous girl with a perfectly shaped body, a sharp mind, and an arrogant attitude. Emma was already there. Emily called Mason over to explain why they were here and where they were going. But Emma stopped her and asked why she had brought an ordinary employee of the company here. Liam put a hand on Mason's shoulder and said that he was his assistant now. He immediately introduced Mason not only to Emma, but also to Melanie, the director of the Fandong Corporation fan. Mason held out his hand and greeted Miss Melanie gracefully. He stood there for about a minute, but even though Melanie was looking at him, she didn't react. But as soon as her cat began to meow, she immediately began to stroke it and gently soothe it. So Melanie said, I've just found a free moment and I'm being harassed again by work talk. She turned around and started walking away from Mason, saying that it was time to relax in the hot tub. Mason looked at Liam in confusion and asked if he really screwed up so quickly. But Liam reassured him, Melanie is a very important girl and she has a bad temper. Liam explained that Melanie owns the largest electronics company and she knows perfectly well that they need her, so she deliberately inflates the price. Liam was very worried about this deal because if he didn't manage to complete it, then he was risking his place. After all, if he loses his place in the company, then he may never see Emma again, who is so important to him. This deal was also important for Emma, because she is a director, and if they fail, she can also be suspended. He thought of Emily in bed and decided it was all or nothing. He had to go all the way. Liam came up to Emma and told her that they should try talking to Melanie again, but she didn't see any use in doing so since they had already talked to her so many times. Emma said that Melanie has an old grudge against her father, which is why she wants to either destroy their company or just stop them from developing. Emma dismissed her assistants. At the same time, David came up to them. He knew perfectly well that their company was in serious trouble and jokingly called the party a farewell party. As if by accident, David remembered that he had to notify Emma that she was due to arrive tomorrow for her wedding to Mr. Jones because both Joan's company and her father's company are interested in a friendly cooperation as soon as possible. Emma didn't want this marriage with all her heart and soul, and the grief on her face was clear. Mason realized that the marriage was only meant as a bargain. Liam was just as upset and said it couldn't be, and Emma's father couldn't have made that decision without her. But David said it was a done deal. Mason decided to put this riddle together in his head. Emma wanted to make a deal with Melanie in order to prove the company's worth. But if she didn't do it within three days, she would have had to marry Jones. She didn't want it with all her might. So her father decided everything for her and went along a more convenient path for him. Liam said that he didn't trust David and needed to make a few phone calls to find out if this was true. But Emma stopped him and said that he didn't need to. She held back her tears, whispering softly that her father had always been like this. He constantly ruled her life, determined her fate. Liam could see that even though Emma was holding back her emotions, the urge to vent was getting stronger so he told Mason that it was time for him to go to his apartment and Emma to have a good rest. David was just happy and he didn't even hide his laughter. Now Emma was forced to marry this old invalid Jones who couldn't even stand up and she wondered how they would spend their wedding night. 
Mason watched them go, thinking only that this was not a fate Emma deserved. He turned slowly, glaring at David, his eyes glittering with rage. Suddenly, the shrill ringing of his phone broke into his silence, breaking the peace of his surroundings. Barbara's voice, coming out of the receiver, was filled with horror and frustration, as if a troubled soul was fluttering in it. There was an all-encompassing, terrible alarm in her voice because their video was subject to hateful attacks staged by paid haters. Barbara was panic-stricken, not knowing what to do in this grim situation, and Anna suggested suing these scoundrels. But Mason warned that in an open trial, his own identity would be revealed. Barbara, as if drowning in a sea of doubts, decided to consult with Becca and Emily to find a way out of this difficult situation, after which she promised to let Mason know what decision they would make. David, a devious and vicious man who was well aware of Mason's secrets, knew that the haters' attack was just the beginning of a big battle. When David said goodbye to Sevenoy, he made it clear to Mason that his true identity was clearly reflected in his exposure. Time passed slowly, and Mason, wrapped in a bathrobe, sat by the pool, lost in thought about how to act at this moment. He knew that David had discovered his secret, and now it was time to be as careful as a tiger lurking in the depths of a dense jungle. Waiting for a call from Barbara was almost too much for him, and he didn't know how Emma was handling this situation. Unable to wait any longer, Mason decided that the moment had come for him to act decisively, but he couldn't wait any longer and decided to go to Miss Melanie to make a deal that would be his salvation. A manly figure stepped out of the dark shadows, moving slowly toward Mason, as if the night wind brought unpredictability with it. That silhouette was Logan, causing Mason to wonder why he was here, what had brought him here. Logan glanced at Mason and said without emotion that he was just doing his job like an insensitive machine with no will of its own. After apologizing to Mason, Logan pulled out the knife and warned him that this was just a routine, something common in his professional life. With a quick, hard movement of his hand, Logan slashed Mason's throat and Mason fell like a doll into the pool, lost in a world of darkness and merciless blood. As the air drained from his body, Mason slowly sank into the depths of the water which became more and more saturated with his life force, turning into a grim carnival of blood. A hand came down to help, trying to pull Mason out of the deadly grip of the water. The last thing Mason caught in his bleary eyes was Miss Melanie, the image of her frantic terror trying to save him frozen in his mind. Avatar loading has started. The game administrator greeted Mason and is happy to inform him that his second dream is already beginning. He began to clear his throat, as if the water was still filling his throat, and then immediately asked how he could have fallen asleep if he was dead. Dead people can't get into the game, the administrator commented and asked how he adapted in real life. Mason was beginning to remember that Logan had landed a non-fatal blow and hoped that Logan would get to the hospital where he could be saved. If he manages to survive, then he urgently needs to leave and stop living in this city. But if he does not leave, then not only he, but also his relatives will suffer. Mason didn't understand why it was so difficult because he just wanted to be successful. But now Mason had another problem. He was standing in front of an open portal to a dream called Invasion of the Beasts. Since there was no turning back, he would fight to the end. But the administrator stopped him because Invasion of Beasts is an extremely difficult level. And without auxiliary things, he can die in the blink of an eye. Mason said that it didn't matter anymore. He decided that he would train his fighting skills non-stop in this world. And if someone wants to stop him, then he will have to try very hard. Mason was walking through a door that gave off a strong, bright glow. Dive into a virtual dream called Animal Invasion. Players will take on the role of miraculously surviving soldiers who must explore the world, fight monsters and survive. Mason carefully examined his equipment and was very surprised because already at the initial stage he had a bulletproof vest and a pistol. How difficult this level is. Drops of thick blood began to fall heavily from above, drenching Mason with frightening regularity. Suddenly, a huge gorilla appeared in front of him, its green fur shining against its glowing eyes, and in its mouth the remains of a soldier like Mason continued to chew. Clearly, displeasure permeated the air, and the gorilla looked at Mason and expressed its fierce dissatisfaction. Chunks of the soldier's legs flew out of its mouth, falling right in front of Mason, creating an eerie sight. It was at this point that Mason realized that his combat gear wouldn't help him much in this situation. The gorilla gave him no time to think and charged, forcing Mason to run because there was no other way out. He took refuge in a dilapidated building in a panic, tempted by a fear that made him tremble at every step. The gorilla easily knocked out the wall with one punch, continuing its relentless chase. Mason reached for his gun, but he wondered if it would help him in this hopeless situation. 
If Mason had been an experienced assassin, he might have been able to find a way out of this hopeless trap. The gorilla, approaching on all fours, felt closer and closer, like an impenetrable darkness, blotting out light and hope. And suddenly she was charging at Mason, all her rage and bloodlust. Mason instantly grabbed a nearby metal pole and slammed it into the wall behind him, preparing to fight the approaching monster. The gorilla advanced relentlessly, destroying everything in its path like a deadly tornado about to devour all life. Mason thought it might just break through the walls. The wreckage would simply crush him, giving him no chance at all. But Mason's plan worked surprisingly well. A snob leaned heavily on the wall and broke through the next barrier, which was broken by the gorilla. It accurately sank into her eye, eliciting an instant reaction of pain and a bloodthirsty growl. The gorilla stopped abruptly and then suddenly ran away, leaving Mason sitting in the blood of the fallen soldier, drenched in blood and stunned by the events. Mason, covered in a layer of blood, remained under the rubble, afraid to even move, because every movement could cause a new danger. After waiting for a few moments and making sure that the gorilla was no longer around, he slowly began to free himself from the rubble, trying to get out of this deadly trap. This dream turned out to be quite different from the previous one. Here, the key to survival was constant movement and steady improvement, constant striving for a better version of yourself. He heard footsteps not far away. He immediately grabbed the metal table without even looking in that direction. Mason's tension was incredible because he was still mentally reeling from the attack, so he didn't hesitate to throw the pole in the direction of the approaching sound. It was the silhouette of a defenseless girl. When the metal spear was already flying, Mason saw that it was flying straight at Melanie. Get down, Mason shouted. She only managed to fall on her back when the spear grazed the helmet on her head. Mason ran up to her and asked if she was all right. Melanie was surprised to ask how he'd ended up here, since he was supposed to be in the hospital. Mason didn't understand why he had to be in the hospital all of a sudden. She got up from the ground, shaking the dust off her buttocks, and said that he ran into her room covered in blood and fell at her jacuzzi, and she called an ambulance. So that was it. So he was strong enough to run to Melanie's room. But in real life, I'm lying in a hospital bed right now, which is why the dream finally started, so Mason didn't die. But even so, he didn't choose Melanie as a player. How did she end up here? She said that she just went to bed and woke up in these ruins and came here after hearing screams. There was clearly something wrong with this game, and Mason was glad to see someone in the game, so he thanked Melanie for saving him. She was cold to him, and said that now was not the time for beautiful words. He had a well-aimed throw, which could help them a lot. Will that help? asked Mason. She showed him the sunken ruins in the sea. She asked him if they looked familiar. Mason looked closer and understood. It was his company's office building. That's right, judging by the state of the building, it's been at least 400 years, and they're time travelers. Judging by the color and smell of the sea, water can have a toxic effect, and its level is constantly increasing. Mason was upset that this was going to be his last game. Melanie said there were two pieces of news, one good news, which is that there are clearly other people here. But the bad news is that there are also huge monsters that are happy to eat people. She asked if Mason wanted to cooperate, and she would lead him, and he would be on guard. Mason was amazed that in such a difficult environment, Melanie was so calm. There was no sense of anxiety or fear on her face. She said that she just wants to survive, and at the moment she doesn't care about anything else. A few hours later, they were already moving through the desert. Melanie asked Mason if he had ever been an athlete before, to which he replied that accurate shots were just a hobby of his. He was surprised that Melanie remembered his name, because when he held out his hand to her, she didn't even notice. Melanie said that at that moment, given her position in society, Mason was simply not important to her which is why she reacted like this. Mason said that having such a life position can very quickly lose all your friends. They climbed another cliff and saw huge walls standing nearby. Melanie agreed with Mason and said it was really worth having good friends. He quickly covered Melanie's mouth. He pressed her against the sheer cliff face. A huge centipede covered in green bubbles was crawling over them. Mason slowly reached for the pistol and released the safety catch. He handed it to Melanie, saying that he didn't really need it right now but that Melanie could use it in case of danger. She thanked Mason and said that she would do everything in her power. The danger was over and they quickly headed for the huge walls. They were as careful as ever and checked their every move. The whole area was clean. It was obviously being cleaned, but there wasn't a single person around. Ahead of them, a huge metal bunker loomed across the expanse of the territory, like an impregnable fortress ready to withstand any challenge. But at the top of it was a giant eagle's nest, causing questions and surprise from those present. 
It was so majestic and monumental that it was doubtful whether there were nests of such huge sizes. From above, a powerful hum rang out above their heads, accompanied by loud flapping of wings, creating a gloomy atmosphere and prompting the inevitable alarm. But what they saw wasn't an ordinary eagle. In the place of this, a huge mutated creature that looked like a crow, with sharp teeth, soared across the sky like a threatening shadow of death. With incredible speed, the raven headed straight for the people who dared to disturb its sanctuary, ready to strike a devastating blow. Melanie took to her heels in a panic, but Mason didn't move, just kept his face straight. She asked worriedly why he didn't run, didn't back down in front of this nightmarish creature. He replied, with complete confidence and no fear, that he would stay here, ready to face the challenge of fate. Melanie, horrified, protested that he couldn't beat the huge thing with his metal bars, but Mason didn't think so. A memory of Logan holding a knife to his throat popped into his mind. Mason had been trembling with fear. I remembered Logan's voice saying that a coward couldn't change his fate because his life could end with a single swipe of the knife. Logan said a coward couldn't be his boss. Mason had already realized that when the dream was over, he would remember only the bright moments, the moments when he was not afraid of danger. He decided to save every moment of it, every second when the fear receded, so that he wouldn't forget that he was capable of overcoming the most difficult challenges. The raven was already so close that Mason, confident in his own strength, grabbed three metal rods in one hand at once, ready for a harsh confrontation. This crow-like creature was huge, its eyes glittering with different colors, and a bone crest grew on its head, as if to symbolize its sinister origin. When the raven was very close, Mason began to throw metal bars in its direction, not stopping for a second. The metal hail of spears completely covered the bird's carcass, piercing it from all sides like the embodiment of unquestionable strength and determination. Feathers and green blood filled the air, creating a strange dance of eerie images. Melanie, in a state of utter bewilderment, could not believe her eyes that such a thing was even possible. In the end, the raven, after making a huge peak fall, fell to the ground, no longer posing a threat. Mason finally exhaled from the depths of his soul, feeling the tension begin to ease. But then something strange happened. The green blood of the monster that had landed on its body began to slowly burn its skin and let out a thin smoke. Mason fell to his knees in agony and let out an involuntary high-pitched scream. Melanie, without hesitation, rushed to his side, eager to help and ease his suffering. But the liquid that covered Mason's body was caustic and dangerous, and Ona immediately realized that any contact with it would cause her the same pain and suffering. Mason continued to scream in pain, his voice piercing the air and sounding like a final cry of despair. Suddenly, the bunker's gate turned green, and then it began to slowly open, as if obeying an unknown force. From inside, a robot rode out on one wheel, exclaiming that a wounded man had been found on the base's territory, and emergency care is activated. The robot was moving at full speed, rushing forward to help Mason until its charge ran out. He plunged the hypodermic needle into Mason with confidence. He injected it with an incomprehensible blue liquid that instantly spread through his body. Mason was still in excruciating pain, and his body was convulsing violently, as if he were fighting something stronger than himself. The robot reported a low battery and slowly began to shut down, leaving Mason alone with the fading light and uncertainty. Mason fell to the ground unconscious, the robot passed out, and only Melanie had to deal with the situation further. A few minutes later, Melanie carried Mason and the robot into the bunker. Mason began to recover, which surprised Melanie, because his injuries were almost incompatible with life. Mason struggled to his feet, and his hair had grown into four horns, but that didn't bother him as much as he was still alive. Melanie said that this robot from the bunker saved him by injecting medicine into him, and after that, all the wounds quickly healed. Perhaps the robot will be able to tell you more about this meta in more detail. All you need to do is charge it. The robot glowed red, power was restored, and a huge contaminated area was discovered. The robot immediately drove to the territory. The robot's head opened as it approached the raven carcass lying on the street. He bent down and began to emit a huge pillar of fire directly at the raven. Melanie said that the robot was referring to cleaning the beast's corpse. Apparently the manufacturing technology of such a robot is very advanced, Perhaps they will need a code word to activate it. The robot had numbers on it. The robot was still emitting a huge column of fire, and Melanie said the numbers. He stopped immediately and turned to Melanie, saying, The home robot has received instructions. The maintenance process is complete. The artificial intelligence system is activated. Summing up, the system worked for 1,130 days. There were 363 collisions with hostile creatures. 
45 tons of waste were recycled. There is 672 damages and a complete repair is required. Mason and Melanie realized that the people at this base had been gone for several years. The robot greeted them and said that it must have been abandoned because it wasn't doing its job properly. But he was still cleaning the base properly. Now Melanie wasn't so sure they were going to be able to find other people. She praised the robot for its work because the base was really in good condition. The robot hoped that very soon the people would return and the base would be as busy as before. Melanie asked hopefully if the robot knew where the humans had gone. The robot correctly replied that before leaving, the human said that if they didn't return in a year, they would go to heaven. The robot naively, like a child, asked if they could tell him where paradise is because he couldn't find such a place on his map. This robot has been working here for more than three years, which only means that people are no longer alive. Melanie said that she needed to check the supplies and plan their future actions. Right after that, she headed inside the bunker. She surprised Mason more and more, how she could make plans after all they'd been through in one day, and she had an amazing sense of calm. The robot began to conduct a tour of the base. The first room was with weapons. A huge number of various military weapons hung on the walls. The only food left was compressed energy bars, which were as hard as bacon that had been dried outdoors for hundreds of years. And this is the medical building. There was a flask with a liquid that people called Medusa's tears, but too much of it could lead to rusting of the human body. Mason asked if it was the same solution that the robot had injected into him. Sprouting hair is just a slight side effect. And at the same time, a pair of scissors popped out of the robot's head. He started cutting Mason's hair and said that this medicine can only repair the wounds on the body, but cannot heal the nervous system of a person. The robot also reported that the base had a core that generates power and an underground reservoir. And Mason immediately asked where the bathroom was so that he could quickly take a shower. Melanie asked the robot why it did not charge itself on its own, to which it replied that it was an ordinary robot and had no right to use human energy resources without permission. Melanie asked the robot to continue the tour for her while Mason went to take a shower. A few minutes later, Melanie was standing in front of a huge screen that displayed incomprehensible drawings and notes. She couldn't understand what it said or why it was there. The robot was speeding toward Melanie with the map, but all of a sudden its wheel mounts broke off. At full speed, the robot fell to the floor. Melanie didn't even start helping him. She just asked him if he could continue to function and what was on the screen. The robot reported that the recordings were made of both the dawn and sunset of human civilization. But for simplicity, they were made in primitive characters so that any intelligent being could recognize them. Melanie was impressed that they even thought through the dawn and dusk of civilization. She opened the map and was startled. They were on an island, or rather the last place on Earth that wasn't flooded by the poisonous sea. The robot said that according to his calculations, this last piece of land would be submerged in just 179 days. But due to the lack of other land, all the monsters had migrated to the island, so they shouldn't leave the bunker. So now they are in a situation where they are unarmed, hungry, isolated, and have no choice but to sit and wait for death. Now Melanie's enthusiasm had subsided, and she no longer looked so determined and confident. Melanie didn't know what to do now, so she asked the robot if there were any clothes on the base that the humans had left behind. The robot said that all the clothes were stored in the living room. Melanie looked at the robot with a cruel look in her eyes and asked if it wanted to know why the humans had abandoned it. The robot assumed that it was not doing its job well. She took the map with her and stepped over the robot. She paused for a moment and said that he was just a useless piece of metal that had no value, but she doesn't want to end up like him. Mason was in the shower when he heard the door slam. He didn't know what was going on because Melanie hadn't been in. It was a robot. It crawled on the floor with a rag wiping it. It started begging Mason. He asked not to be scrapped. He could still do the cleaning. The robot said that he missed people very much, their kindness and love, and did not want to leave this world. He missed so much the time of ordinary human life that took place on the base when everyone interacted in harmony and justice. He was studying the real world with insects. I played with the kids. And of course he cleaned the territory. He rubbed the floor with his last hand and begged Mason not to get rid of him. Even though he couldn't see how clean he was at wiping, he still continued to do it. The robot wanted to continue serving people. Mason picked up the robot and replaced its eye. Mason said that its parts are very outdated, but how to fix it? To which the robot replied that all the parts are in the engineer's room. Unfortunately, there were no engineers in this world, but Mason promised the robot that he would fix it himself. The bathroom door opened. Wearing a light housecoat over her naked body, Melanie came inside. She said that they were going to end soon anyway, 
so there was no need to be ceremonious. And then she handed Mason his new clothes. He was sitting on the floor completely naked, became shy and asked her to put her clothes on the table. She said that they are now in a terrible situation, but she does not agree to certain death. She was interested in the question of whether everything was in this shelter, but why people left it. Mason reminded her that people had gone out to find a secret place. This world is going to end soon, doesn't it matter where you go? Unless it's a place to hide from the end of the world. She untied her robe and said that the bunker was suitable for this. So why did people leave it anyway? She took off her robe loosely and stood naked in front of Mason, but calmly continued to say that she needed a little time to decipher the inscriptions that people had left behind. As the water continues to rise, the island is filled with monsters and their safety becomes a big question. She began to descend into the warm bathroom she had collected and said that she looked forward to working with Mason because he was good at dealing with them, as practice had shown. Mason tried not to look at her. He barely heard what she was saying and he was more concerned about how she could strip naked so easily because he might not be able to restrain himself and lash out at her in a passionate rush. She went on calmly, saying that Mason should take care of their safety. His gaze drifted to the bathrobe lying beside the bathroom. There was clearly a gun under it. Just like with Emma, this girl also experienced it. And why do all girls want to experience men? Maybe they like it. Mason dressed calmly and was about to leave. And Melanie said that she was surprised at his calmness. Because from him, like from any man, she expected something completely different and thought that she would have to go to extreme measures. But he did not lose his composure. She said it was a lesson in a situation where they are on the verge of life and death. Feelings should not affect their composure. He thought of the gun because that was what Melanie had meant when she spoke of extreme measures. He remembered what Mr. Liam had said when he said that Melanie was a very strong and cunning woman and it was important not to fall into her trap. Mason wondered if she was not so much afraid of being raped as of losing the only person on this island. It was a bit awful, so Mason took the robot and said it was time to get busy. She lay in the bathroom and thought that Mason's style of behavior was quite simple, which is strange in the conditions of the end of the world. But the fact that he still had moral principles was very positive. Mason was already in the engineering bay and had started repairing the robot. He asked the robot why he didn't say a word when they were all in the bathroom together, to which the robot replied that he was worried about saying something unnecessary. Mason didn't know what to expect from Melanie, but as long as she didn't interfere with his training, he didn't care what she did. The robot was afraid because fighting monsters is too dangerous. Mason said that in the other world too, he was in danger everywhere. But now he was determined that he would train until he had finished with his enemies here and there. It takes a lot of courage for people to step out of their comfort zone, to hit the barriers of fate. Mason gave everything he had, and as a result, others destroyed what he worked for. In his heart of hearts, Mason knew that if he ran away from the difficulties again, he would be considered truly dead. The robot asked if this other world was the paradise of the people who had lived with it before Mason came. Mason smiled a little and said that everyone has their own understanding of paradise. For him, it was a close-knit, strong family, which he so hoped to create. If he trains, he will be able to ensure the safety of all his loved ones. The robot listened to him with bated breath, like a small child learning basic life principles. When Mason finished speaking, the robot didn't hesitate to ask if there was anything it could do to help Mason. Of course you can help. Mason said, because if he fights monsters, he will definitely get injured and the robot's treatment will be very useful to him. The second day came. Melanie was eating an energy bar and she said that she liked the new robot image perfectly. 